Um, first, a fully virtual meeting of the Health Committee here, and um, I'd like to remind members about the protocol regarding electronic devices. So uh, there have been no apologies received, members. Um, moving on then to chairperson's business. Um, this week, I met uh, earlier this week with the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy. And I have to say it was a fascinating, a fascinating presentation in terms of the extent of speech and language and sometimes undiagnosed or unrecognized speech and language problems and, and the potential solutions that speech and language can bring to many of our more, more vulnerable groups. Um, and they were, they were outlining um, issues with looked after children, issues within um, prison populations and a uh, huge high numbers of people with unidentified at times speech and language issues and the one thing that they said that that they were seeking to increase in awareness of and they will be writing to the committee more fully on this um, at my request but they had asked uh, that professionals across a range of, of areas um, if they where they see behavior the, the, the mantra they had was see behavior think communication just as, a, as an aid memoir to all sorts of professions that, that that may be what's behind some of that. So I thought that was a, a particularly useful meeting, I have to say. Um, also, I want to note and, and welcome the fact that the mother and babies, uh, Magdalene Andre's research has been published. Um, we have requested a briefing on that, and we have also, uh, members, we are in the process of organising an informal briefing uh, meeting with the reference group, as we have uh, spoke about before. Uh, I'd also like to welcome the fact that the vaccination program is continuing to, to roll out. I noted last night that there is now an online portal for, for uh, booking onto the GP system. There does seem to be some teething areas and some problems with that, but hopefully that will, that will, those will be ironed out and that will lead to a, a, a better outcome, hopefully, or a faster, a faster booking system. And finally, I want to welcome very, very much the £500 payment to health workers. I think that's hugely appropriate and very, very welcome. Those workers, as we are all acutely aware, have been under such huge pressure, have been going above and beyond what is ex what anyone should expect of them for such a long period of time that I think that payment is a, is a, very, a very welcome. I, I sincerely hope that those staff all get that full payment and i i also welcome that the students are are similarly being provided with a recognition payment of two thousand pounds and i know there is questions out there around who qualifies for the payment and i i think it would be uh, useful to see the department clarify and very quickly today who will qualify for those payments but in general it is welcome that those are that those are taking place so moving on to the minutes then, members, I refer you to the draft minutes there of 20, our meeting of the 21st of January at tab 3.1. Are members content with the minutes? Yep, content. Thank you, members. There are no ma matters arising there, members, from those minutes today. So moving on then to our first briefing this morning. Our, our briefing today is from the department in relation to the looked after children strategy. I refer you there, members, to your papers at tab 5 of the pack and to the official speaking note, which is a tab five of your table papers. I advise members that officials are here to brief the committee on the new strategy for looked after children and care experienced children and young people. This is a joint strategy from the Department of Health and the Department of Education. And um, I, think, I think it's useful to see that joined up type of working in the interest of very vulnerable people I have to say. So very much looking forward to this morning's presentation. I would now like to welcome by video link Ms. Eilish McDaniel, who is Director of Child Care and Fa Family Policy in the Department of Health. Ms. Elaine Lawson, who is Head of Looked After Children and Adoption Policy in the Department of Health. Mr. Ricky Irvine, Director, Inclusion and Wellbeing, Department of Education. And finally, Mr. Colin Reid, Head of Safeguarding, Welfare and Inclusion in the, Edu in the Education Authority. So uh, broadcasting can just bring the, uh, the panel up into the spotlight, please. And I'm starting to see some of you there now. So uh, you're all very welcome here this morning, panel. Thank you for coming along to the committee. We're looking forward to your presentation and hopefully to some uh, question and answer session with members. So could I go to you, Eilish, and just uh, can you outline how you're, going to, um, how you're going to roll out this morning's presentation, please? 
Okay, thank, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, members of the committee, for the um, opportunity um, to brief you um, this morning. I mean, this is a joint strategy. We are um, joined by the um, Department of Education. So I intend to start, um, Chair, and then I'll hand over to um, Ricky Irwin, um, who will um, deal with some of the educational um, aspects um, of the strategy. Okay, so um, what, I, what I intend to do is to set out the um, background to the development of the strategy, um, the case for change. Um, the strategy's overarching aims and objectives, and I'll also provide an overview of the strategy's um, key com commitments to action. Um, some of the statistics that we provided you with already uh, in the paper and um, sent to you earlier in the week and, and, and in your papers, um, some of the statistics are slightly different uh, because we've received um, updated figures just in the last um, 20, uh, sorry, 48 hours. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, the children and young people and their, current, their carers, parents and advocates um, who've helped in the development of, of this strategy. And I think it's so much um, richer and probably um, more relevant um, as a result. So turning to the development of the strategy, um, as members are aware um, uh, from the Health and Education Minister's earlier correspondence, um, the new strategy will replace um, existing strategy. Um, Current Matters in Northern Ireland, A Bridge to a Better Future, um, which was endorsed by the Executive in 2009. The new strategy is being introduced at a time when there are more children in care than any other time since the introduction of the Children Order in 1995. At the end of September 2019, there were 3,362 children in care in Northern Ireland. Numbers have continued to increase um, during the um, pandemic, and there are now more, uh, sorry, now um, 170 more children in care than, than at the start of April um, 2020. Uh, and that's potentially more than 30 extra children's homes if we work on the basis of five children per home, although I'm not saying that all of those children um, were placed in, in children's homes. Between the beginning of May 2020 and the end of December 2020, and the average three week rolling average number of referrals to children and social services was consistently higher um, than the pre COVID average based on the year ending on the 30th of September 2019, peaking in late September when the average number of referrals was 35% um, higher than pre COVID figures. In January 2021, the average number of referrals dipped below the pre COVID average, but referral numbers have now increased again. Um, to above pre-COVID um, levels. And that's that's a pattern that we saw at the start of the pandemic. We saw it again um, to in, in the circuit um, breaker, and it's partly um, why um, the Safeguarding Board has this week um, uh, tried to remember um, people to um, be very mindful of, of children who may, may be at risk and make referrals um, to um, children's um, services. Um, in addition to the rising numbers of children and young people in care, we're also experiencing greater complexity of need within the current look after and care labour population. More children and young people um, have a disability, um, some have mental health and emotional um, uh, health and, and substance misuse issues. So, for example, 12% of all looked after children have a disability. Nearly half uh, of these children and young people have autism, and while a further 30% have a learning disability. This rises to 15% among care leavers at age 19. There are also higher rates of young parents in care and in the care leaver population. There are, of course, many children and young people who have happy and fulfilling experiences in care and achieve their full potential, and I think that's, that's important um, to note. However, um, we know that over 40% of looked after children enter care from the, the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. In 2017-18, 43% of children were taken into care from the 20% most deprived areas and within Northern Ireland. And in comparison, around 5% of children originated from the 20% least deprived areas. Research has shown um, it's more likely that children in those areas will experience health and social inequalities, such as lower life expectancy, higher suicide rates, higher rates of mental ill health with more mood and anxiety disorders, and more instances of self-harm higher rates of alcohol-related deaths, higher drug-related deaths, greater likelihood of becoming involved in the criminal justice system, reduced income and increased homelessness and unemployment. 
by way of the strategy, um, we want to address the inequality um, experienced by care, care experienced children and young people um, to help children and care reach their full potential. And in particular, um, to close the educational attainment gap between them and their non-care experienced peers. And that's why the strategy is being taken forward jointly um, with the Department of Education. This was recognised in the draft programme for government, which included an outcome to give children and young people the best start in life and a commitment, a, a specific commitment to improve um, support for looked after children. In the DE-led cross-departmental children and young people strategy, um, children and care and care leaders are identified as a particularly vulnerable group who require additional support to reach their full potential. This new strategy for looked after children will support the aims of the wider children's strategy by placing and maintaining a focus on care experience children and young people. The stated aim of the strategy is to improve the well-being of care experienced children and young people and to give them the best chance of the life they each deserve. We're all very, aware, uh, very well aware of the need for and the benefits of early intervention approaches and particular supports needed um, during times of transition. As a result, the strategy um, doesn't only focus on children who are currently um, in care or looked after, it extends to those who are on the edges of care, including children with intense needs who require intensive support at home, those returning home from a period of care, and those leaving care to make the journey into adult life. It is also extended, uh, or, sorry, intended to extend to children who are adopted from care or who leave care to live with someone other than their birth parents, so for example, under a private law order like a residence order. The strategy is rights-based and is firmly anchored um, to the Children's Services Cooperation Act, which requires government departments and children's authorities to cooperate with each other and to improve the well-being of all children and young people in Northern Ireland. Well-being within the strategy has the same meaning as in the Children's Services Cooperation Act, and in the wider children's strategy, which the Act requires the executive to adopt. By way of action under the strategy, the aim is to, as far as possible, ensure that care experienced children live in a society um, in which equality of opportunity and good relations are promoted, that they are physically and mentally healthy and living in safety and stability, that they are learning and achieving and enjoying play and leisure opportunities, and finally, um, that they experience economic and environmental well-being and are enabled to make a positive contribution to their, uh, to their own communities and to wider um, society. Within the world of looked after children, the term corporate parent is well understood and captures the responsibilities of health and social care trusts to looked after children. The strategy introduces the concept of the corporate family, which recognises that trusts need the support of other public authorities, government departments, their arm's length bodies, local government and indeed voluntary community and, and independent sector organisations to effectively deliver improvements in wellbeing to care experienced children and young people. Turning to what we will do to improve the wellbeing of care experienced children and young people, there are 61 commitments to action in the strategy and I'll focus on those actions other than those which relate to learning and, and, and achieving and, and Ricky will deal with those separately. The key actions include a cross-departmental family and parenting support strategy, which um, uh, will be developed to promote positive parenting, help to build resilient, stable and strong, strong families, and meet the needs of families experiencing greater challenges. We will enhance family support hubs to reach a greater number of families who need early help services, and which may prevent the involvement of social services at a later stage. A new way of working with families within social services, known as the signs of safety practice model, will continue to be rolled out. It's a strength-based approach within social work, which seeks to involve um, the wider family and friends network um, to help keep children safe and well. A new framework of integrated therapeutic care will be rolled out across looked after children's services to ensure the care provided is person-centered and therapeutic. It will place an emphasis on relationship focused work and will provide the basis for securing safety and stability for the child. Under the framework, practitioners will build an understanding of the child's presenting needs and put in place therapeutic supports and interventions for the child, their families and their carers to help them build positive relationships 
and support a range of improved outcomes. In fostering, um, we'll, we will um, continue um, to work to attract greater numbers of committed individuals into this critical role through robust marketing campaigns informed by foster carers and organizations who work with them. Foster carers know best what will attract individuals and families into fostering and what we need to, to, support, um, to, to, to support them to enable them to stay. We will expand specialist foster care placements to support young people with additional needs, such as children with a disability, mother and baby placements, um, those with challenging behavioural behavioral problems or unaccompanied um, asylum seeking children. In residential care, we are introducing peripatetic support teams to provide multidisciplinary support to young people who may be in crisis to, among, among other things, prevent entry into the criminal justice system where looked after children are overrepresented. So for example, in 1819, around two in every um, five children um, or young people in custody um, were in care. We're also expanding flexible outreach services to provide support when looked after children feel particularly vulnerable, such as in the evening or at weekends. And there will also be a capital program for residential pr provision for children with a disability. For children and young people leaving care, we're introducing post-permanent support teams, and the teams will work, for example, with children who have left care through adoption, who continue to need support to perhaps deal with early trauma and to minimise the risk of their new family home breaking down. We will continue to work with the Department for Communities and the Housing Executive to expand the accommodation op options um, for care experienced young people, including those leaving care, which keep them safe and offer a stable and supported home base from which to pursue a career training or further education. We're on, also introducing a new capital scheme, which we've called um, the Staying Connected Scheme. Um, this is intended to enable children and young people to stay longer with their carers, to stay closer um, to their last placement, have an aged out of care, and to stay together with their sibling group. So this could involve making it possible, for example, for a foster carer to extend their home or for a trust to purchase a property within close proximity to a children's home. For unaccompanied asylum seeking children, we intend to introduce a regional social work assessment, reception and advisory service for separated trafficked and unaccompanied and, and separated um, uh, unaccompanied and asylum seeking um, children. That's social workers with the knowledge, the skills, the expertise and experience necessary to address the needs of and provide appropriate support to the increasing number of unaccompanied um, children um, arriving in Northern Ireland. We will also invest around £10 million to establish a new regional purpose-built residential facility for, unac for um, unaccompanied and asylum-seeking um, children, um, which will increase placement capacity. Work has already started um, with the Department of Justice to establish a new regional care and justice campus in place of current secure care and juvenile justice arrangements. The campus will include a secure care centre, on-site step-down provision and community-based satellite services. Work has been taken forward um, uh, within the department um, on a new mental health strategy and I know the committee is aware of this and in relation to um, CAMS, uh, a managed care network for children and young people with <coughs> and high intensity care needs will be established. A holistic health appraisal will um, be introduced in place of the current annual medical assessment arrangements uh, and will involve school nurses and school, school nurses. The views of children and young people were important um, uh, and hugely helpful in the development of the strategy, and they will be equally important um, during implementation. Among other things, um, we will introduce a biennial survey to gather the views of children, care experienced uh, uh, children and young people and, uh, and those um, responsible for their care to assess whether they consider um, outcomes are improving for them. Legislation will be required to deliver some actions, and this will be done by way of an adoption of children bill, um, which the Health Minister intends to introduce in the Assembly in March, um, subject to executive approval. The bill um, will place advocacy arrangements on a statutory basis, require trust to publish details of the services they um, offer in their area to young people um, who have left care, enshrine corporate parenting and um, principles and law, enable disabled children to be able to short break care away from their families 
without needing to be looked after and by a health and social care trust. Strength and care planning arrangements and the operation of fostering panel arrangements. Place a duty on health and social care trusts to undertake an assessment of need for adoption support services. Extend support for care leavers up to age 25 to, to enable them to continue in or return um, to education or training. And finally, place a duty on health and social care trusts to promote the educational achievement of looked after children and young people and to minimise disruption to their education when making decisions about where they will live. In terms of funding, we've already um, uh, been able to secure recurring funding for some actions. Others um, will be cost neutral and some will require new funding. We're launching the strategy um, in a period of challenging budget settlements. Um, this is likely to impact on the pace with which um, we act and implement change. But successful implementation of the strategy won't only rely um, wholly on new investment. It, it's also about doing things differently. Um, with the resources currently available to us. We've already trialled some initiatives um, using transformation funding available to both departments, and that has helped us lay um, fairly strong foundations, and our intention is to continue to build on that as quickly as funding permits. In terms of measuring how um, uh, well we are doing in implementation, the intention is to introduce a report card with performance measures or indicators associated with each of the strategy's outcomes and work is progressing on the identification of appropriate indicators informed by responses to the consultation on the draft strategy. We will use a range of methods to measure performance and we will collect and analyse data, building on existing data sets, undertake surveys of children, parents and professionals, evaluate new services, commission research where appropriate and initiate inspections and reviews. It's important that we deliver tangible, lasting improvements and well-being outcomes. So if you were to ask me um, what success um, would look like, um, potentially fewer children in care, improved health and education outcomes, the attainment gap closing, greater numbers of care leavers and further and higher education, living in stable homes and generally doing well in adulthood, Care experience children who are loved, who feel loved, and know how to love with ease in return. In short, living the lives they deserve to live and that we are collectively duty bound to make possible. And at this point, Chair, I'll hand over to um, Ricky um, and both of us will address any follow-up questions um, that you may have. Uh, good morning. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Alice, yeah. Go ahead, Ricky. Thank you, Ricky. Yep. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ali. Yes, I'm Ricky Urban, uh, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing in the Department of Education, and I'm joined by Colin Reid, who's the Head of Safeguarding in the Education Authority. I suppose just following on from Alice's opening remarks there, um, I'd like to focus just a wee bit on our journey within education um, that, that we've had, which has led to this first uh, strategy dedicated to children looked after. As Alice has noted, uh, we commissioned the OECD 2016 case study, improving the educational outcomes for looked after children to help us pinpoint the most effective interventions for this cohort uh, of children and young people. Supporting them had been a priority for the Department of Education for a number of years up to that point, albeit with limited success and a refocus was required. The case study included a number of key themes which have informed our approach going forward. So these included the following. A coordinated strategic approach between health and education with strategic priorities set from the perspective of the child, a focus on well-being for all children and supporting the particular needs of looked after children integrated within an overarching strategy, identification of the key drivers behind poor outcomes and addressing these in an integrated way, a steward identified from within existing governance structures to build a truly child-centred approach to the care, education and well-being of looked after children, provision for looked after children to be harmonised across agencies with interagency working needs regularly reviewed, uh, and removal of barriers including insufficient funding, staff time, quality home placements and underinvestment in research and programme evaluation. 
Um, it also looked at providing tailored support to children who are looked after in education to ensure they have a positive and engaging learning experience and enhancing access to support resources and training for educational settings, and building capacity with an education on trauma and attachment uh, and reviewing and adapting the personal education planning process and coordinating this with the personal learning plans for children and young people with special educational needs. Um, identifying the primary causes of the educational attainment gap and measures to address it and developing an effective multi-agency um, approach. We believe that all of these elements combined will transform the educational experience for our children and young people um, who are looked after. So taking these findings into consideration, we took two main steps. We agreed with the Department of Health that a joint strategy would be developed and we developed a pilot that would test the role of the champion for children and young people who are looked after within the educational settings. And this champion had the role of identifying the key interventions to raise educational outcomes at key stage two, improve multi-agency working, challenge existing supports, and identify and respond early when the looked after children needed additional support. The educational element of the joint strategy focuses on building the success of the pilot of the champion by establishing the role on a permanent basis within the education authority, supported by a new service, uh, as well as targeting the areas that I mentioned previously. Um, so that's just a brief uh, overview of the educational aspect. Um, thank you for this opportunity to update the Health Committee on progress. And we're keen to hear your views and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ricky. Uh, thank you, Eilish. Um, very, very comprehensive. The, the combination of the two presentations, um, extremely comprehensive, and there's clearly been a lot of work done, and I think that's, that's uh, to be welcomed. Um, I suppose just in terms of the question and answer session, maybe if, uh, if one of the panel could sort of lead on an answer, and then unless there's something specific or, or that needs added to, maybe Eilish, yourself or one of your team can identify who will pick up on a, on a particular question from members. So firstly, from me then, um, that you had, you had indicated there are significant funding resources and a difficult funding situation, Eilish, but can you quantify in, in real numbers um, what the estimated funding will be necessary to deliver this strategy and what the uh, prospects in the current climate are of securing it? Okay, so the, the estimated cost of delivering the strategy over the next three years um, is around £24.5 million. Um, pounds. Um, uh, that, that's in resource um, terms, and um, uh, we also um, estimate a, a capital need of around £11.5 um, million. In, in year one, um, 21 22, um, the cost of implementing the strategy, I think, is around £7.8 um, million. Um, pounds. Um, we have made bids here um, to cover the cost of the actions um, that will be taken forward um, this year. Um, the outcome of that bidding exercise um, remains to be de determined, so I can't say with any certainty um, that we will secure all of the funding um, that we um, require to implement the strategy um, in year one, but I have made the point um, that the budget settlement next year will be incredibly um, challenging um, for us. So my expectation is that we may not be able um, to secure um, all of the funding um, that we that we need. It doesn't mean that we won't um, do some of the things that we plan to do. Um, it may just mean that we do them in, in slower time at, at a slower um, pace. So it may, be, may not be done in 21-22, but it could be done in, in, in a future year. Okay, thank you. And just just briefly, does that eleven point five million capital include any part of the Care and Justice Campus, or is that separate? So we, we haven't um, costed um, the Care and Justice Campus at, at, at the minute. Um, it's too early to do that, um, Chair. So we've just concluded the consultation on proposals for the um, Care and Justice um, Campus. If I'm honest with you, and um, we already invest a considerable amount of money. Um, across the both facilities and um, the juvenile justice um, centre and the secure care centre. Um, I think we should be able um, to deliver something better um, with the funding and currently um, available um, to us, um, but, but that remains to be um, determined. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, just just to declare my own interest in terms of having worked as a previously as a social worker and indeed um, with looked after children at at times. Um, can you you have mentioned throughout Eilish, and I, I do appreciate the fact that you have mentioned young people, and um, you've mentioned people who are aging out of care, and so so there's clearly an awareness of of the issue of uh, that it's not just children we're talking about here, and we're all I think very conscious here on the committee of the cliff edge that many young people face leaving leaving looked after care or can face. I'm not saying they always do, but um, can you explain what support is is provided to older children and younger people? And what age it's anticipated, or is there any change being uh, considered within the consultation in terms of the age that supports would continue for? Because we know it's very important, the relationships, um, the structures, that, that, that support around a young person at that very vulnerable stage. I know some countries in Europe who do this type of a thing very very well actually go right to 25 but are there any thoughts or any plans within the consultation to look at the issue of age oh okay so um i, I think uh, i did cover that in my in my opening remarks apologies if that wasn't um clear so under the adoption of children bill the intention is to extend the um the age um limit for um, support having left um, care, so that it will move um, to age 25 for those in education, um, training um, or employment and, and there will be supports um, available um, to um, young people um, up to that age. I mean, I, I think over the course of the last couple of years, we have tried, for example, um, to extend the range of placement options for children um, who have left care. So. Um, We've now got around 16 um, supported accommodation projects um, across um, Northern Ireland, providing around 165 um, placements. Um, and we also introduced in the last couple of years um, supported lodgings. And that's that's enabling um, young people to um, not be in, in, in a group setting, but, but in a, a familial um, setting and with a host um, family. Um, we've got around 30 placements. Um, at, from two pilot projects um, that we established, and now the intention is to roll that out um, across um, all five trusts and extend that to around 50 placements, 10, 10 placements per, tr per trust. So we, we have tried over the course of the, the last couple of years um, to make a better offer um, to children who have left care. I think that will improve further um, when we extend the age range um, under the adoption and children bill. Of course, that's not going to happen overnight, um, Chair. It, you know we need to get this the the um the legislation through the assembly and then obviously um uh, and obviously then move to implementation of, of the um, legislation but the proposal uh, is there yep thank you and that that that's very very welcome um and then in terms of the progress and the anticipated level of progress and i know you've set out the areas but um what sort of what sort of to you what would success be in terms of closing the gap in terms of progress for for younger people within education. Oh, okay. So, the, for the, example, the statistics, the, the, the statistics yeah. are, are not very um, pretty, um, and, and, and Ricky may may well come in um, uh, behind me here. But if we look, for example, at GCSEs, and if this is a measure of how well children are, are doing, and I appreciate that there are other measures of how well um, children um, are doing. But for GCSEs, um, obtaining five of them at grades A to C. Um, for um, children who are looked after, um, it's around um, 40%, 43% for children in the general population, it's in the order of um, of 70%. So the, the attainment gap is huge. So if this strategy is successful, it is a joint strategy with the, the um, Department of Education, um, we, should, we should see um, that. That, that dreadful statistic um, begin to um, move uh, and, and, uh, and the gap being closed um, quite um, substantially. So it, it, is, it is one to watch. Um, at A level, um, the, the gap is, is, is incredibly um, the same. I think it's 7.9 um, looked after um, children achieve um, three A levels of grades, A, a star to MC. And I think for the general population, it's at the order of 40%. So again, the attainment gap there is huge. Um, it is a, a statistic I think that we will want um, to closely monitor um, over the course of the next couple of years and I think it will be one determinant of how well our, 
otherwise and we're actually doing. Ricky, do you want to add anything to that at all? Uh, yeah, thanks, um, Alice. I think you know you've you've covered you've covered the stats, you've covered the stats there. Um, I mean, there is a huge gulf uh, between um, attainment levels between looked after children and non looked after um, children, and GCSE and A level results, I suppose, are are just one den one indicator that education would be looking at. But um, in terms of the evaluation of the project. That we delivered it focused more on key stage two children and younger children uh, and we knew um, from evidence that performance in maths and english would dip significantly for children who are looked after between key stage uh, key stages one and two so that became the focus of the early intervention and transformation program and um, that was delivered um, through the education authority uh, and the evaluation of that showed us that that uh, dedicated support uh, and um, approach that was taken resulted in the performance levels actually um, being in line with the rest of the population uh, of children around key stage two. So for us within education, our focus will be on primary initially and expanding that out. Um, to other primary cohorts, particularly beginning at key stage one and potentially in the early years. And then as we go forward with our delivery uh, of the strategy, we'll then move into um, the post-primary um, area uh, with additional investment that would be required for that. Thank you. And then final one for me, Eilish. Um, I'm conscious that, that this has been a, a extremely comprehensive it's also been quite heavy in terms of, of uh, the language, and, and, and we, we all understand that. But I'm wondering, in terms of co-production and co-design, how the voice of children and young people were included in this and how, how they were supported to engage in what are, what are heavy enough uh, issues in, in many ways. But also, are they, are they involved in ongoing review and how that's being supported? Oh, oh, okay, so I mean, I, I can I can tell you that children and young people um, were very much involved in the development um, of the strategy, and, I, and I'll take you through some of what was um, uh, done just to give you a measure um, of that. And Elaine may be able to come in um, behind me um, with more um, detail. And um, if I can say, I mean, I've already referred to the intention to undertake a biennial survey. Um, you know, so periodically we will ask children and young people um, how well um, we are um, doing. Um, so I, again, we we will continue to capture their voices um, throughout uh, implementation. But but just just to give you a measure of of the level of involvement of children and young people um, in the development of the strategy. So five public um, events in each of the trust um, areas um, uh, supported by the voice of children and young people um, in care um, workshops again facilitated by um, VoIPIC to capture um, the views of under 12s, adolescents and children with a disability. Fostering Network did exactly um, the same with the same group of children. Um, Fostering Network also captured the views of foster carers, um, issued a questionnaire, um, play and survey work um, facilitated um, by um, VoIPIC, um, include youth then, um, captured the views of older adolescents, care leavers and those in the, in the Juvenile Justice Centre, um, Start 360, um, again working with the same the same group of um, young people. Um, uh, Max um, uh, uh, again did a bit of work for us to capture the views of older adolescents and, and care um, leavers and children in Northern Ireland. Um, likewise, um, facilitated um, discussions and um, with a, a range of um, stakeholders. So I, I, I just want to assure you um, that they were very much part of the um, development of the strategy and will continue um, to be um, very much part and central to the implementation of the strategy and their views will be um, captured and, and acted upon and more, more importantly where, where that's appropriate today. Okay, thank you. So I'll go then across to members um, and I'll go first of all to Pam Cameron. Pam, go ahead please. Can Pam be brought into the spotlight there, broadcasting? I don't think, yeah, there we are now. That's me yeah. now. 
Thank you, Chair, and just uh, say thank you, Eilish, Ricky, and the team there for um, uh, your attendance today at the committee. And um, I absolutely welcome the, the opportunity to scrutinise what is an extremely detailed and ambitious uh, cross-departmental strategy in relation to looked after children. It's particularly pleasing to see that um, whilst the development of the document has been led by departments of education and health, that there's a substantive overlap with um, the work of all executive departments in the commitments presented. So that is, it's really, really good. And I thank you for that. Um, okay, so just to kick off on some questions, um, your document states that in Northern Ireland, we're fortunate that over three quarters of children and young people in care are able to live with foster carers. There are also commitments on recruiting more specialist foster carers. Can you provide more information um, in this area on how higher numbers of foster carers will be achieved? Um, that would be my first question. And then I wanted to also ask around um, if there's a, a time frame for the development of the family and parent support strategy. Um, it's obviously it's deep, it is deeply worrying that around forty percent of young people in custody, or um, forty percent of of young people in custody are or have been in care, and does this criminality generally present itself before a child coming into care? And how will this strategy foster links with the innovative approaches by the justice sector in tackling um, this type of offending? Okay, um, thank you, um, Pam. And we can start with um, foster carers, first of all, then, and, and the recruitment um, of um, foster carers. You're, you're right that um, around 79% of children who are looked after are actually looked after um, by a foster carer. And, and I think it's important to point out within that group, um, we've, you've got a combination of um, kinship carers, so children who are looked after um, by and people who are not members of their own um, family or, or, or some of them may be um, friends and I think it's important to note that for the first year um, the, the, the balance between kinship and non-kinship non -kinship care has actually shifted and um, so we've now got actually more children who are in kinship care within that foster care bracket, bracket than, than those um, who are in non-kinship non care so I think that's the, the first point that I would like to make. In terms of how we encourage people um, into um, Foster care, um, you know that 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 is done on a rolling um, basis, um, you know. So every year we have a um, foster care fortnight, and that the purpose of that is to is to try to encourage um, people um, into the um, role. I mean, it, it, it requires a, a very special kind of person, I think, to become um, a foster care. And, and one of the the other interesting things that we did was to. Um, introduce private sector approaches. So we used a marketing um, firm. Um, to actually um, try to, um, not to try to, to develop a, a, a marketing um, program um, to, um, to encourage more foster carers um, into the role. And, and that actually worked um, very well. And, and we will continue um, to use um, that approach um, going um, forward. In terms of the family and parenting support um, strategy, um, I, I have to say that the development of that has been slower than than we would have liked um, that, that partly due to the um, pandemic um, the family policy unit um, responsible for the development of, of the strategy and for which I'm responsible um, was actually uh, 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 worked quite um, extensively on, on child care issues um, over the course of the um, pandemic and that's distracted us um, somewhat from from the development of the strategy, but our intention is to consult um, on a draft strategy, um, hopefully in the not too distant and future. So a draft, uh, we do have a draft. Um, other departments have actually been asked um, to consider um, the draft and, and, and as quickly as, as we can, we will consult um, on the draft. And, and I think that's important to point out too, that the family and parenting support strategy likewise is a cross departmental um, strategy led by the Department of Health, but other departments um, will have a role um, to play um, there also. Um, turning to the custody um, issues, um, then, I mean, th 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 this is partly why we're taking um, forward um, the Joint Care and Justice um, Campus um, Programme. Um, that's recognising that we have um, a, 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 an impossibly high number of looked after children um, within the um, justice um, population. 
and the intention um, by way of that program um, is probably threefold. Um, what we want to do is to keep children out of secure care, whether it's juvenile justice or um, the um, secure care um, centre um, at Bangor. We want to keep them out of there as much as we possibly um, can. Um, unfortunately, for those who um, enter um, secure care, um, again, we want to make them a better offer, and that's partly um, about um, taking, you know, greater therapeutic approaches, etc., establishing multidisciplinary teams um, within a secure um, care um, centre, and then the third aim um, will be to um, have a better pathway for them out of um, secure um, care, um, purely for the purpose or, or, of ensuring um, that um, they don't and aren't um, readmitted um, to secure care. In, in the future, so we need to better support them um, when, when when they leave. So that, that that's the triple aims of the um, campus um, um, program, and that's that's pretty well developed. Um, we've consulted on a range of um, proposals, and we're in the process of um, uh, of analysing um, the responses um, to consultation um, at the minute. That's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll then go, I have an order at this point in time indicating Cara Hunter, then I'm going to Paula Bradshaw, or Leah Flynn and Jerry Carroll. So go ahead, Cara, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Eilish, Elaine, Ricky and Colin for being here today. Um, I find this a really interesting um, report that you've just done there, so thank you. Um, I just have a few questions just around... Um, it was mentioned uh, in the notes that you had uh, over with us around, um, you know, transgenerational involvement in social services and that that can often create, um, you know, uh, like alcohol and drug dependency. I'm just curious, um, with the new strategy, is there any recommendations on how to tackle that within uh, children in care? Okay. Um uh, and and you're you're quite right, um, Cara. Thank you for for, for your your question. Um, you know, very often, um, the children of children in in, in care end up in care and um, themselves, and, and that's a cycle that we would absolutely um, like to break. And um, by way of this um, strategy, I think key to that will be early intervention. I think I think we do need um, to get to to get into families. And work with families at the, that earlier um, stage. You know, so we have over the course of the last um, couple of years um, placed a greater focus on earlier in, uh, earlier intervention um, with families. So initiatives like um, the family support hubs. Um, we've got twenty nine of those now um, across um, Northern Ireland, uh, and they exist um, to ensure that where families need. Um, a, a, earlier help and that that help is actually available to them and that actually prevents um, then um, maybe problems escalating um, to the point where statutory social services um, need um, to become um, involved uh, and we, we've concluded just in, in the last couple of years that one project um, continuing to run um, an early intervention transformation program which again was a cross-departmental um, program um, the, 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 the aim of that program again was to um, act um, earlier and provide uh, and provide um, families and children um, with, with um, greater help at, a, at an earlier stage. I think we need to do more of it, if I'm honest and with you. And, and again, um, we, we've set that out in, in the strategy as one of our aims. Um, we will um, hopefully make um, a greater um, a greater effort um, to offer earlier help um, to, to, to families. Thank you, uh, Eilish. I, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. That's fantastic to hear because I know there's a lot of complex needs, you know, with children in care. Um, I just have one more question around, actually two more. Um, I had read there 63% uh, of children who leave care age 19 are either in education, uh, training or employment. I'm just wondering, is there any further steps or recommendations within the new strategy to help uh, increase that statistic? Okay, so this is my response to, to the chair's question about extending um, the age range for children who have left um, care. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we, we will extend that to age twenty five. The purpose of that um, is to ensure that, um, that help is available longer for children who have left care, particularly those who are in education, training, um, and employment. You know, part of the solution too is to ensure that they have stable homes. 
um, that they can live, that, that they that, that they're living and not moving from place and place. Um, so greater stability of, of, of placement too, and we want to deliver. But I think by extending the age range, mm -hmm. um, uh, that I, I think we should begin to see um, that statistic um, improve um, too, and have greater numbers of of them either in education training um, or employment, simply because they, they're better supported. Mm -hmm. Uh, that wrap around support. Okay, thank you. And lastly, uh, I had noted there, it's very welcome news. You had said around um, £10 million pounds of investment um, to create a building for unaccompanied uh, asylum seeker children. I'm just wondering, um, uh, can you just go expand a little bit on that and tell us a little bit more? Okay, so uh, at the minute we have a regional um, facility for um, unaccompanied um, and separated um, children um, in Northern Ireland, and um, the intention is to is to de develop that and um, further, um, to create a, a purpose built um, facility, and um, because the facility that, that we have at the minute certainly isn't um, purpose um, built, and purpose and built, and by the greater investment, we'll actually increase the number of places um, available and um, for um, these young people. And um, I mean, the numbers have been increasing um, year on year. Um, I think the statistic is something like. In the last five years, um, there's been um, a 140% um, um, increase um, in the number of referrals um, to social um, services, and a 177% um, increase in the number of unaccompanied children actually in, in the care um, system. So, and I think in the last couple of years, between 18, 19, and 19, 20, the number has actually doubled. So, we have seen greater numbers of these um, young people. Um, come into Northern Ireland, we need to have placements and um, for them. That's partly what we're doing by way of the creation of um, the new facility. And we, um, and we need to have greater supports um, for them too. So we're doing things like, um, and I've mentioned this in, in the opening um, remarks, we will put in place a new um, social work um, service, a regional um, service, so that we build up a level of knowledge and expertise um, among social workers and, um, you know, to enable them, empower them, and make them better equipped to actually um, offer support to unaccompanied um, children. But but the numbers have, have increased significantly over the course of the, the, the last couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. That's me, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chiara. And going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to the panel for your presentation this morning. My, my first question is a, a broader one, and it may well be for Colin, um, and it's really around the week that's in it in terms of the revelations from the mother, baby homes, etc. What, what are the safe? What are the safeguarding mechanisms in this? Because it's it's very easy half a century away to say we didn't know we didn't ask the right questions we didn't have the right provision in place so could you speak to me about safeguarding please thank you oh that's a complicated question um paula i suppose uh, what we um hope to do in terms of certainly the project that we're involved in is to enable children to be safe cared for and well looked after within the education context in which which they are to facilitate their educators, their teachers, to understand the position of, of looked after children and to facilitate trust and understanding about education between um, schools, foster parents and social workers. So I suppose in terms of our project, what we're seeking to do is build knowledge, understanding, take a trauma-informed approach to, to the experiences and life experiences these young, these young children and young people have and try and facilitate a safe and caring environment for them to be educated in and brought up in. Um, through their experiences with an education. Okay. Um, is there anything from a health point of view as well around safeguarding, please? Okay. I mean, what, what, one of the one of the outcomes that we're we're seeking to achieve by way of the strategy is is safety and stability. Um, uh, you know, so we do need to make certain that um, where children live, um, they are safe, and, and there have been um, particular challenges um, over the course of the last couple of years um, around issues like child sexual exploitation um, etc um, and um, you know we've had a number of um, reviews um, into that particular um, issue and recommendations made as a result of, of, of that so um, I mean that, that is an issue that, that we are focusing on um, reports and made recommendations and made and those recommendations are being enacted on by, by bodies, for example, like the Safeguarding and Board for um, Northern Ireland. So it 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 is absolutely in our sights. And um, Paula, you know, safety among other 
things um, is, is what we will um, you know, seek to achieve for these young people. Um, thank you. Uh, my second question is in terms of the Stay Connected scheme around the accommodation options. When a few of the health committee members that I met with Voipik and some of the young people during the summer, you know, they did raise the issue of that sort of cliff edge at 18 where, you know, you go from being in, in a carers and a safe a fostering home then to uh, moving sometimes to accommodation that isn't even within the county you live in. So I'm just wondering, give us a wee bit more detail on that. Obviously, time is of the essence because people are approaching their 18th birthday and I think the more accommodation that can be put in place, the quicker the better. Thank you. So, I mean, that that's, that's one of the aims of the stay, Staying Connected um, uh, scheme, um, which is a capital um, uh, scheme. Um, uh, it, it is about enabling um, some young people when they reach, reach age 18 to be able to stay close to the people um, um, that they have been familiar with, possibly over uh, over a number of years in, in, in children's homes, um, etc. So um, we've created the scope um, for um, trusts to possibly, uh, um, you know, by purchase property and um, using capital and funding that would enable some of those um, young people um, to stay closer, maybe to a children's home um, that they've just um, come out of um, at the age of um, 18. There are other things um, that are in place um, too, Paula, um, for example, the um, Go on the Extra Mile scheme, um, which is a foster care um, arrangement. and. Um, through that, through that scheme, and the intention is to put that on a statutory basis by way of the Adoption and Children Bill. Through that scheme, um, young people are enabled to stay with their foster carers mm -hmm. um, for longer beyond um, age, age 18. And I think there's around 253 young people um, currently um, who are in um, the GEM um, scheme. I think by placing it on a statutory basis, um, we will strengthen that scheme um, further. Okay, I, I think that like my daughter turned 18 at Christmas there, you know, and they're not really adults, they aren't in, in law, but sometimes emotionally they're not there. And I, and I suppose this um, looked after group are probably very vulnerable to if they get out into the community and don't have proper support. But thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Paula and panel. And then going across now to Orlea. Go ahead, Orlea. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. Um, thanks, Ailish and Rippy, as well, um, for your presentation today. Um, I just want to touch on, um, Ailish, and your, some of your opening remarks. I'd be interested to know, I know that the strategy was, um, the document that we have, the final version, was September 2020. And obviously, the departments will have been looking closely at the impact of um, COVID. Um, and, and you know, how the outworkings of that with kids that, that need to go into care. Um, and that figure of, I think you had mentioned, one, that, that there was 170 plus that are in care now um, since April 2020, um, and that you have been noticing trends, you know, where you've had an increase in referrals. And in, in, the, in the strategy and the piece of work that the, the departments have done, is there any sort of, um, you know, lessons that have been learned um, or, you know, is there any learning from COVID that's reflected within the strategy? And I ask that question because I know that we have briefings at the Health Committee previously and at the beginning of the pandemic, there was concerns, especially around the, the schools closing and stuff and that routine where the teacher, you know, would be the most likely person to identify some of the risks and be able to make those referrals and there was a fear that maybe referrals might decrease because of that. So I'm just interested to know a wee bit more around that figure that you're looking at now in the middle of the, the pandemic, that you've still been picking those kids up. You know, is there things that um, has been done over the past 11 months that we could maybe learn from that wasn't being done in the past mm -hmm. where you're picking up kids that you might you might have missed in more normal, normal circumstances? Oh, okay, thank you, um, Orlea. Um... They, you're, you're quite right. Um, COVID has had a huge impact on on children and, and families, and, it, and it's partly the reason why we um, developed a vulnerable children plan. And we're, I know that we're going to be briefing the committee in, in a few weeks' time on um, that um, plan. But that was intended um, uh, to uh, as a mechanism for departments to work together and um, to respond um, uh, uh, effectively to the needs of. Of very vulnerable children um, as a result of the um, pandemic and under that plan one of the things that we did and uh, and Ricky might be able to come in behind me 
uh, and speak uh, in a bit more detail uh, about this. Um, you know, we, we had a strategy to get um, vulnerable children um, into school. Now, it didn't, didn't work in, uh, as well in, in the first um, uh, lockdown, um, but um, arrangements are in place at the minute to, as far as possible, get as many vulnerable children um, into school, because I think that provides them um, with the level of support um, that they um, that they may not have um, at home for for, 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 for many um, reasons. So I think um, that was um, very important. W within health, I mean, a couple of things that we um, did, um, you know, we did provide um, additional support for um, foster carers, um, for, for example. So um, we added to the foster care um, allowance and the household element of the foster care alliance again just to support and um, foster carers um, to deal with children who would otherwise have been um at at, at school and, and i think trust at the start of the pandemic too and um, made payments to all of the um foster carers in northern ireland to, just to help them and um, support um children um in their care um, and we have invested in, in residential care where, where the pressures have been um, great because of you know, maybe staff illness and staff self-isolating um, just simply having to deal with challenging and um, behaviours and within residential care we, we, we did make an investment in uh, residential care and um, to I think of the order of two and a half um, million and, and, and that was about um, to enable and um, trust to um, put contingency staffing um, arrangements in, in place but also to develop or put in place um, isolation units which were necessary um, to um, within um, residential and um, care. Um, in addition to that, we've um, you know made investments um, in our um, family intervention teams too to inc increase capacity um, there. An investment of around um, four and a half um, million um, pounds. So, in addition to trying to get children into school, and we did that working and um, closely um, with the Department of Education, we have tried to provide support um, to, um, to to those caring um, for looked after and um, children. And during a very difficult period, and, and you're right, and um, there will be there will be a tail to this. There will be a legacy, um, to this. We've now got 170 children, more children in care than we did at the start um, of the pandemic. That itself has created pressures, um, for the system. Um, you know, we've, we've now had to find 170 um, additional um, places, um, for those young people, and 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 that has been a challenge for um health and social care and um, trusts. Some of the investment was not intended um, as a response um, to that. Have we fully reflected it in the strategy? Possibly not, Orly, Orly, So um, it's it's one thing I think maybe that we do um, need um, to look at. That said, um, we did develop the vulnerable children um, plan as a response to um, um, COVID-related um, experience by um, children and um, families. Thanks very much, Alicia. Maybe just to um, follow on from that a wee bit. Um, when you had touched on the funding earlier um, in response to Colin's question, and so you're looking at that 24.5 million um, resource and 11.5 million for capital. So, does, does that, will that funding come from Department of Education? And, and just on that, I'd be interested. In Obviously, we have other massive strategies coming through um, the health department at the moment too, with um, major overlink with the issues that users are dealing with in this strategy. So when you're talking about the higher rates of alcohol and drug related deaths, the higher suicide and self harm rates um, and the higher rates of children that, that need to go into care and, and all the, the correlation between the deprived areas. I'm just thinking there's going to be loads of overlap with what's going to be contained within the 10 year mental health strategy with the substance use strategy. Um, and then also we obviously have the Protect Life 2 strategy as well. So, and, and I know that all those strategies need to be funded and I'd be interested to know what what interaction will, can this strategy have with, with those other pieces of work? Um, do you have anyone, for example, that would sit on the educational or sorry, the executive subgroup on um, on mental health wellbeing and suicide prevention, because I think it's really, really important that it's great that we'll have all these new strategies coming to the fore, but how can we actually, you know, make sure that we're getting the most and the best out of them? Because there is all that overlap, um, you know, contained within them around the mental health and, 
and, and the suicide and the substance um, misuse. Thank you. Okay, so can I can I deal with the funding point um, first of all? So, so the, the figures that I quoted uh, in response to the um, chair's question um, are the cost to the Department of Health of implementing and the strategy the Department of Education will separately um, be making um, investments and Ricky may want to um, say um, something about the um, extent of the investment. I mean, you're, you're entirely right um, that all these strategies are, uh, are interlinked. Um, so if I can um, give you an example um, of the um, using the children, the wider children's strategy, for example, and, and I've made that point in, in my opening um, remarks, um, you know, we've worked very closely with the Department of Education that led on, on that strategy to ensure that looked after children um, have been um, certainly the focus placed on them and they are identified within that strategy as a group um, that require um, specific um, attention. Um, uh, 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 within the wider um, strategy. Likewise, on the mental health strategy, I mean, that's being developed um, within the group of which I'm part um, in, in the department. So again, we've been working um, with officials and involved in the develop development of that strategy to ensure that the specific needs of looked after children are taken account of um, within um, the mental health um, strategy. We've worked with other um, colleagues across the department in terms of um, uh, drugs and alcohol and um, suicide. So um, where we can, um, we make the case, and rightly so, that specific responses may need to be made um, to look after children who have um, specific needs. And actually, um, you know, we are responsible for them. We've taken them into care, and we are that we are the co corporate and um, parents, um, and we need to ensure that their needs are are met. So I just want to assure you um, that we do try to influence the development. Of other strategies and, and work with um, officials in our own department and and in other and um, departments and um, to ensure that that's the case perhaps if i could come in from an education um, perspective on the funding point uh so in terms of our commitments in the strategy and um, we're looking at, at around 1.7 million uh, per annum for the duration um of the of the strategy uh some of that has indeed already been baselined within um, the department's uh, budget, um, but the balance will uh, need to be bid for in future um, budgetary rounds. But I think it's important to say that in terms of uh, meeting commitments in the strategy, the funding that I've mentioned there wouldn't be the only source of funding um, which would benefit children who are looked after. So uh, we've been working very closely with the Department of Health on a, an emotional health and wellbeing framework as well. Uh, and funding has been secured for that on a recurrent basis from um, next year onwards, totaling around 6.5 million. So many children who are looked after will benefit from the projects which will be taken forward under that um, framework. Uh, similarly, we have a nurture program, um, and that's um, supported to the tune of around 4 million per annum. And many children who are looked after have attachment um, difficulties within primary schools and would benefit from the nurture groups which are set up um, within those primary schools. So there, there's probably a range of um, frameworks and programs um, which will in future years support children who are looked after. Thanks very much. Thank you, Orlea and Jerry Carroll then. Jerry, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Elish and, and Ricky for the presentation. Um, I suppose the first question, um, the um, Elish, um, the, the increase obviously since two thousand and nine of, of people in, in looked after um, uh, settings is obviously very worrying, as, as people have said. I mean, what what's the assessment of that? I mean, it's it's obviously um, the year after the the, the last recession, um, and it's it's increased. And there's you know forty three percent of people, according to the pack, obviously um, who looked after come from the most depraved areas. Um, so kind of what's, what's the, the reasoning, uh, the rationale or the, uh, the sort of the understanding for that increase? I mean, I, I would presume it's, it's largely connected to economic precarity um, and economic financial pressures. And is there an expectation that that will increase further with the recession that we're in and um, going to be further plunged into? 
Okay, thank you, um, Jerry, um, for, for your question. I mean, you're, you're quite right. Um, the, the numbers have steadily um, increased over the over the last twenty um, years. I think it's um, something like eighteen percent over the last five years, um, thirty percent over the last ten years, and um, at forty six percent since nineteen ninety nine. I mean, I, there there are very clear um, linkages um, with deprivation. You know. So families who are struggling, um, uh, unfortunately, um, children are very often um, on the receiving um, end uh, of that, and I think that became very, very evident um, during the pandemic um, too. Um, you know, so families struggling with issues like domestic violence may be um, exacerbated by um, being um, locked um, down, um, but children being physically um, harmed um, too. Uh, um, and um, you know greater instances of, of chronic and um, neglect and too. So I mean there there is a very strong link um, with um, deprivation, um, and unfortunately children having um, to come into care or indeed be placed on the um, child protection um, register um, too. So very strong linkages with deprivation and the child being on the um, child protection um, register. I think there was research done by Queens in the last couple of years um, that. Um, Specifies what what the figure is. I just can't remember it off the um, top of uh, off the top of my head, and and, and I think it does. Uh, it, it makes maybe a strategy like a family and parenting support strategy um, incredibly important. It does make um, um, us doing things earlier incredibly important too, so that we can get into families and maybe help them um, sort um, some of their issues out at, 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 a, at an earlier stage, um, uh, so the children um, can. Um, Potentially not be taken into care um, uh, 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 otherwise. So, um, I, I mean, that, that's all that I can say in response um, to your question, um, Jerry. And I think you know the, the, the figures bear that out. Thanks, and and obviously, it's concerning that uh, in that period that you know there's been a, a huge increase in uh, multi-millionaires in Belfast. You know, um, it's gone up the league tables in terms of wealth uh, accumulating at the top. But then, you know, an increase of people, um, you know, economic um, destitution or, or vulnerability at the bottom. So that's quite concerning. Uh, just, just one final um, question, Elise. Did, did you say the the adoption bill will be presented to the executive in March? Did I hear that correctly? And if that's the case, um, when will it come? Likely to come to the floor of the assembly. And then, just a final question for Ricky. Um, we, the Department of Justice, had a statement in the assembly. Uh, earlier this week, um, pointing to, I think it was uh, either high 70s or 80% of people in prisons um, had uh, dropped out of uh, school um, at a young age with um, either very little or no qualification. So what, what's being done to kind of reform education to make it um, more amenable to people so they're not, um, you know, neglected, dropping out? Uh, and sort of forced into uh, in the prison as well. Um, so uh, an answer on that would be useful as well. Thanks. Okay, so well, I, I deal with the adoption of children bill first, and then Jerry, and then I pass over um, to Ricky and Colin. Um, y yes, the intention is to introduce um, the bill in the Assembly in, in March. So I think we'll have a first and second reading um, before Easter, and then it will come to the um, committee. Um, for scrutiny um, after um, Easter, I think that's that's the plan um, at this stage, and and, and we are, we are in course um, to uh, to achieve that. I mean, it, it has to it, it has to come to um, it, to the assembly. I think at March the latest, um, given the it's a fairly substantial um, bill, uh, around 150 clauses um, contained and um, within it. So um, we we need to get it into the assembly um, around March time to give us the chance of of getting it through. Um, it's uh, the, the full passage um, um, before um, uh, before the assembly is is, is dissolved again. Um, Jerry, I suppose in terms of your your broader question there about how do we how do we stop children you know dropping out of school? Uh, it's 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 a massive it's a massive question, uh, and I suppose there's a range of of programs and initiatives within the department. Which are, are designed uh, to, to try and avoid that situation. Um, I mean, obviously, early intervention would be a key underlying principle in terms of supporting children the moment they come in uh, to contact with the education system. But I think one way to illustrate it might be 
um, for Colin to set out a wee bit more about the project for children who've been looked after and the approach that was taken there to bring them um, closer into um, the education system, Colin. Yeah, uh, Chair, you, you've heard, um, and Jerry, you've heard, you've heard, you've heard a lot us talking a lot about our project within education. This started in two thousand sixteen and was funded jointly by um, Health and Education Department, the Early Intervention Transformation Program, and and um, Rick had indicated the research basis for the interventions. This this program has a very very good research base for what it does, and at the end of it, which just it's just completed, it's had a very successful. Um, uh, uh, evaluation by the Department of Finance in terms of what we're doing, but to give, give a bit of, bit of a flavour, we've worked primarily in key stage two, and we saw, Ricky mentioned earlier, there's a the, the attainment gap starts to really accelerate at key stage two for children, so in this preventive develop element, we work with uh, 450 children who were looked after around uh, 271 primary schools and 21 special schools over the over the over the period of time and um, the types of interventions that we put in we've appointed a children looked after champion who champions within ea and across the education system um, looked after children and um, we have a cross departmental uh, project team that has steered our interventions with representations from health education trusts um, and the project itself has focused very much with 18 staff who have worked closely with teachers foster parents, trust staff, really to promote the centrality of education within um, ed education within the doctor children's lives, uh, to try and um, work with, 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 with teachers to understand social services, social services to understand uh, schools. We provided um, resources and can boxes for uh, many of the primary schools for, 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 for where they've looked after children. We've disseminated good practice, including putting care and education from the Department of, ed from the Department of Education. And we created what was called the TAP project in, in uh, Southeastern and Belfast Trust, which is a, a, a small a multi-professional team with education psychology, clinical psychology, that provides a consultation model for schools and supervising social workers around education, and also a formulaic approach for the, those children with the absolute, um, absolute needs, most needs. And that's been highly successful at um, helping social workers, teachers understand the nature of what they're dealing with and has a trauma-informed approach at the centre and attachment of, uh, approach at the centre of its, of its intervention. We have set up um, helplines, electronic inboxes to facilitate foster parents, social workers, uh, schools to contact us about education issues. And we've seen great success um, from the, the interventions within that project. Um, uh, Ricky had indicated that we'd seen a reduction in the, the um, attainment gaps between children who looked after and their, 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 their peer group. The intention is that we roll this project out to key stage one and two with a focus um, and looking to the future about moving into the post-primary phase and the, um, the, the nursery and early year, years uh, sector. Um, we have about, at the moment, about 18 staff um, who are made up of education welfare, education psychology, uh, teaching, youth service who work together um, on the project. We'd probably move up uh, subject to, to funding to a cohort of around 30, 30 staff to cover the entire key stage uh, key stage phase. Um, what's interesting as well is through the, the work of this project and our collaboration, we're able to gear up additional resources from um, other sectors. So, for example, youth, the youth service and EA are looking to put in additional resource. Our colleagues in health and social care are appointing a number of uh, um, band five social workers to focus um, purely on the needs of looked after children and to work closely with our project and through working in this collaborative way we're actually able to um, embed early intervention and prevention with these the, these cohort of children and hopefully Jerry, as as we move the project through that we'll see a reduction in children uh, falling off or getting involved in criminal justice stuff and actually prevent uh, some of the things that you you, you mentioned Chair, if I may, if, if I could just make a further point about the importance of collaboration and joint working between um, health and education, um, which is kind of a central theme which runs throughout um, all of this. Um, we talked about um, the COVID experience previously, and, and Ali should set out some of that around vulnerable children. Um, what, what is um, very clear mm -hmm. is that if we are going to support our most vulnerable children, there needs to be very clear and integrated working between health and education um, authorities, uh, and that is something that I have seen um, enhanced uh, over the course of the last few months, um, not just through COVID, but um, through a range um, of programmes, including 
children with special educational needs, for example, uh, and children who are looked after. Um, so I would engage regularly with um, Eilish and her health colleagues on, on a range of matters. Uh, and I think what we've got to is a point where there is excellent um, working uh, and we are seeing improved outcomes. And I think the Vulnerable Children Plan and the contingencies that we put in place to support children in the education setting uh, and those children who are very vulnerable in the home setting as well um, have shown that. And in terms of children who are looked after, we know that 55% of them would have a special educational need. That's a significantly higher percentage than the general uh, pupil population, which is around 20%. So it just underscores the importance of ensuring that we are working together at various levels, both on the ground and at a strategic and policy level. Uh, and I think we're doing that now. And just you, a bit, may, uh, sorry, Chair, if I may add, Chair, that one of the things that's been you, most successful is we've worked with um, the Department of Education in developing PEP guidance. So this is um, personal education planning for looked after children. And we've, we've piloted that. With, uh, with 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 schools and with 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 super, with uh, social workers as well, working together for um, looked after children, very successful in terms of having meaningful, purposeful, real plans that involve, involve the voice of the children in in their education needs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jerry, and thank you, panel. I think that has been a very very comprehensive. I have to say, and 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 I want to thank you all for your, for your contributions to that all and, and that's a very positive note I think Ricky that, that you're finishing on and it's in keeping with other things we have heard if one good thing is to come out of this pandemic it would appear that silos have been broken through to a large degree and I suppose in relation to this to this work that we're talking about I'm also struck by a presentation I received this week or a meeting I did this week with speech and language therapy where they were indicating um, about the huge levels of speech and language issues that, that are within looked after children and also within children within the justice system and adults within the within the, the justice system and i think that whole idea of interdepartmental working of multidisciplinary working is uh, something that that will add value to everything that we're doing it, to, to me i suppose it's the modern day equivalent of the old saying that it takes a village to rear a child i think everyone brings a certain part of the the solution and the more we're open to that i think the better we can deliver for those people who who so badly need it so listen, uh, that's been very, very useful, very comprehensive. We look forward to engaging with you in future around the vulnerable children and indeed I'm sure on this strategy as well. And um, I want to thank you for your time here this morning, for your engagement with the committee and, and your answers to the questions and to wish you all the very best of luck in the time ahead in terms of de delivering and developing the strategy and implementing that. And um, just to, to wish you all the very best. And thank you for presenting to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Members, um, uh, yeah, okay. Members, I'm now going to take a short break there just before we go on to our next session. So could I ask members to return at 11.20, please? Thank you. That's us, Chair. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. So we are um, resumed now again in public session and we are moving now to item six, which is SR 2021 forward slash eight, the Mental Health 1986 Order, Amendment Order NA 2021. I refer members there to the memos, the clerk's memo and other papers at tab six of your main pack. Members will recall that the minister wrote to us earlier this, this month to advise of changes proposed to mental health legislation and guidance in response to coronavirus pressures. These will include a statutory emergency code of practice as well as the SR before us today. The Minister's letter is at tab 6.5 of, of your pack there. I can advise members that a departmental official is here today to brief us on the temporary changes including this SR. So I'd now like to welcome Mr Thomas Adele from the Adult Mental Health Unit in the Department of Health. And can I ask Broadcasting to bring the Thomas into the, uh, into the spotlight, please. Good morning, Thomas, can you hear me okay? Good morning, I, I can hear you good, yes. 
Yeah, and we're hearing you clear also. So uh, please go ahead, Thomas, and brief us on, on the background and the content of this SR. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to give you this briefing. You asked me to talk about the mental health amendment order and on the other changes we've done in, in relation to Coronavirus Act, which have been revived. As, as you know, mental health services across Northern Ireland exist to provide care and treatment to those suffering from mental ill health. And these services are now more important now than ever because of the pressures and the effects of the pandemic. As you're aware, mental health services are under significant pressures and were under pressure before the pandemic. The impact of the pandemic has caused an increased demand both in the number of people seen and the acuity of those that are seen at the same time as staff are not available in the same levels as before. The pandemic has had some direct impacts on the ability to deliver services. So the increased levels of acuity of our mental health inpatients due to the pandemic has had increasing requirements on special observations. That is, care days one to one, two to one, three to one, and so on. For example, Southern Trust has estimated that this has created an additional staffing demand of equivalent to about two weeks as a result of that there's led to staff being redeployed in the inpatient services and staff redirected towards the special observations. There's also been a number of outbreaks affecting the patients and staff and the effects of the staff outbreaks has an impact on the ability to deliver services um, properly. So Northern Trust, for example, recent staff outbreaks in Hollowell has impacted a total of 56 staff and the recent outbreak in the mental health inpatient ward in Southeastern Trust affected 20 staff in one ward, including 55% of the nurses. These extra pressures and outbreaks are having an impact on the ability of staff to carry out the normal functions and could, unless mitigated, limit the ability to carry out the statutory requirements of the mental health order. So if you're looking at the amendments we made, so the amendments to the second opinion provisions and the revival of the mental health corona coronavirus act provisions are, are mitigating actions to ensure that we don't end up in situations where we can't deliver the services. As it was last year, we hope that they will not be required, but it's my view that it's better to be prepared and have them in place and not need them than not have them in place and need them. So the mental health amendment order um, amends one of the safeguards in the mental health order around second opinions. For some patients who are detained for treatment who receives continued medication, a second opinion is required for that medication to continue. Um, the SR changes the time period when this is required from three to six months. It is the same legislative change that was made in March last year. Uh, and as during the first period of change, the department is committed to revert to three months as soon as it is safe to do so. The second opinion safeguard exists to ensure that patients who are detained are not receiving medication unless it's actually needed. It's essential to avoid arbitrary medication. And the second opinion is carried out by a doctor that is appointed by RQA for this purpose and is commonly referred to as a part four doctor. Across the whole of Northern Ireland, there are currently five part four doctors and one of these doctors are unavailable long term due to COVID-19 reasons. That, that means that currently we currently have four of these doctors. If there are further reductions in the number of part four doctors available for any reason, it could jeopardize the ability to carry out second opinions. If a patient receives medication and a time period is complete, and a second opinion has not been provided, the medication must stop, otherwise it's unlawful. Stopping medication for these patients could lead to worsening condition of the patients, uh, slowing of recovery, and increasing risks of harm to the patient and others. And to ensure the medica medication can continue, even if there are no Part 4 doctors available, the amendment to the time period has been made. To mitigate the decrease in the safeguard, we have advised the trust to still do second opinion in three months if at all possible. We're also reviewing the need to keep amendments at weekly meetings, and I'll, I'll come back to that. We also have been in contact with RKA and will jointly work to increase the number of part four doctors available so we won't end up in this position again. This was the intention last year, but because of the continued COVID pressures, we've not been able to do so yet, but that is high up on our agenda. We have also revived the temporary modifications in the Coronavirus Act that amends the mental health order in certain areas. These are the same provisions that were commenced in April last year and that were suspended in August of last year. Broadly speaking, these provisions allow a wider group of people to carry out certain functions and to extend some timelines 
to give professionals longer time when carrying out certain actions, all that are to meet the requirements under mental health order. To mitigate the risks of reducing these safeguards, because there is a reduction in safeguards, we've issued an emergency code of practice. The codes include guidance on how um, provision should be used, that they're permissible, and that means that it can be used, but it don't have to be used, and that they should only be used if all other options have been exhausted. Usage of some of these provisions, provisions also carry reporting requirements where the department must be informed of the use. When the immediate pressures on the mental health staff is reduced and the risks of the large-scale outbreaks and staff absences is removed, with, for example, increased levels of vaccinations, the second opinion amendment will be reversed and the coronavirus act provisions will be suspended. That is an absolute firm commitment. The issue of standing down the emergency provisions is a standing order item at the weekly COVID-19 mental health meeting attended by service users, the board, PHA, and the department. Um, I, I sit at those meetings and I discuss this particular issue every time. It is a clear intent to only keep these emergency provisions as in place as short time as possible. Th these measures are clearly undesirable. It is not something we want to do. However, without these measures, it may not be possible to provide safe care and treatment to some of the most vulnerable patients in our mental health system. That, and that would create an even more undesirable outcome. So it's, it's a balance between safeguards and the ability to treat patients. And we believe that we that making these amendments is right at this point in time. I'm happy to take any questions you have or provide any clarity to that. Okay, thank you, Thomas, um, for that. Uh, I suppose my first question would be, previous um, versions of this SR were more explicitly time limited. Whereas and the explanatory memorandum here indicates this relaxation in standards will remain in force until, and I quote, the end of the coronavirus pressures period. So can you explain why that approach is being taken on that occasion? And also, could you explain how is the end of the coronavirus pressures period being defined? The, the approach we're taking here is, the, is a statutory approach we have available to us. We can amend the time period. We don't believe we can set a sunset clause in an easy way in this SR, uh, in a similar way that it came up with other pieces of legislation. Um, the, we, we intend to keep this in place as short term as possible. We are reviewing this weekly. Um, we are hoping that this will only be for a number of weeks, not months. Um, and the intention is to really step it down. What we're looking at is the availability of staff, the availability of staff to carry out these statutory functions. We, we currently have four second opinion doctors available to us. The fifth one will become available when they have had uh, vaccinations to end time period to let the vaccine work. Um, at that point, and if the trends continue with less and less staff being affected by COVID, we will be reversing this as soon as we can. So that's what we're looking at is the, is the availability of staff to carry out statutory functions. W when we have an outbreak in a ward that happened in the Southeastern Trust where a significant type proportion of the staff are unavailable, that, that's when these things become problems. If one, one more doctor becomes unavailable, we might just be in a point where we cannot provide the second opinions, um, which would have a bit worse outcomes. So it's, it's simply to cover that this scenario. Yeah, and I was I was struck by that that you said where where it, it almost gave an impression that this is a a fundamental um, weakness in terms of the provision of of the the qualified doctors or or certified doctors to roll this out, which which is a concern that that public health uh, emergency public health measures would be um, needed or being deployed in that situation where it's it's maybe more a fundamental case of supply. So that is a concern, and, and I do want to note that 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 appears to be a very shaky foundation uh, in terms of a protective measure for a very vulnerable cohort of people and, and I think it would be uh, uh, something that needs addressed very very quickly in that respect because clearly you could very easily see another every every member now represents 20 percent of the of the supply provision you could very easily in the current circumstances see another 20 percent and another 20 percent go in and that would create significant significant problems so the minister's letter there, Thomas mentions weekly review of the measures, and you have mentioned that yourself indeed. What detail can you share in terms of uh, how many times this has been used, even even within the initial period, and how many times it's been used since since this has come into place again? The initial period of last year, we, we don't believe this was used a single time. Um, the, okay. All the second opinions were, were within three months, and as of yet, it is not. I, I have the use has not been reported to me. 
um, at, the, at the last week meeting, which was on Tuesday this week. Um, so we're hoping that this will not be used. The trusts are not putting in procedures to use these unless we actually have to do them. So second opinion should happen in three months, if at all possible. Um, so we would hope that it will end up being six months. If it's not three months, we hope it'll be very shortly after three months, if that makes sense. Yeah, and in, in relation in relation to you, your your remark there that uh, it's difficult to have a sunset clause, it was possible before, so I don't understand what makes it difficult now. It's uh, I, I'm following the advice I'm receiving in terms of drafting. Um, I, I know the policy well. I'm not an expert in the in how to draft these regulations. I, I can only follow the advice best advice I have advice given to me, and I've been advised that this is the best way we should draft these um, regulations. I mean, you can have my full assurance. And I know the minister supported this as well, that we do not want to keep this in place for longer than required. As you saw last year, we, we did take them back as soon as we could, as soon as it was practical to do so. So, so we intend to do that again. Well, I think I think, I think the committee has has been um, at times, there's been some reassurance in the fact that there are sunset clauses putting a focus on removing these off the books again. So I think the, uh, could, could you commit to bringing that issue back? And I'm looking at the drafting because I don't I don't understand if it was possible before why it's not possible now. So could you could you look at that again? I will certainly look at it um, and I'll come back to you. Okay, the final the final um, the final one for me then is in relation to engagement with stakeholders around this measure coming in again at this point in time. How, how have you or how do you intend to engage with relevant stakeholders who would have an interest in this in this area? given the serious issues that are involved? Yeah, so, so we have regular discussions with uh, service users, the trusts, the board, uh, the health and care board, public health agencies, and professional bodies on, on these issues. Um, so this has been discussed at those meetings, which we talk about coronavirus pressures and COVID pressure in general, um, where we have all those groups represented in various forms. So this has been discussed with representatives for all those groups. And what about the the advocacy sector around rights and and uh, mental health uh, champions and and those type of uh, interested parties? What discussions have there been with those? We we shared the uh, proposal to do this with the champion before we did this, and we got uh, her views before decisions were taken. So the champion has been informed at, at all times. Um, there are no advocacy groups on the groups where we discussed this. Um, but there are service user representatives. So we have service user uh, control in that way or a service user um, engagement in that way, sorry, um, part of my language. We, we also discuss this at other mental health meetings that we have, regular mental health meetings, where there are representatives, both service users and community voluntary sector um, groups as well. So th this is stand this when these things are brought up, they are taken very serious at those regular mental health meetings that take place at various intervals between one every week to every month. And and how content would you say those stakeholders are, Thomas, with this being reintroduced? Um, they're content. I mean, we, we all agree that they're very undesirable. We don't want to do this, and that, that is shared by all. We also understand the risks of not doing this, and therefore there is an agreement that we really don't have much of a choice. This is what we have to do to make sure that patients can receive medication that they need. Um, the risk of not doing it are too high. But as I stressed, that we, we need to have more part four doctors. Um, so we don't so we don't end up in this position again. That's it, it's a fundamental flaw in the flaw in the system, as as you note. So that's what that's what we need to address. That's a fundamental mm -hmm. problem. Okay, okay, thank you, Thomas. I'm going to move on. Then I'm going first of all to our deputy chair, Pam Cameron, and then I'm going to our Leah Flynn. So Pam, could you go ahead, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Thomas, for your um, presence again at the committee today. Um, obviously, um, as a party. Uh, we've always said these powers to waive established practice should only be used when necessary and proportionate. So I'm glad to hear that that has been the practice to date. Um, and also we don't question the, the rationale for, for their use, but obviously there's a very bleak picture out there of a 30% increase in acute mental health and patient admissions in Belfast. And that really does highlight the, the challenges facing our, our mental health workforce. Um, you had referred to... Um, outbreaks in Hollywell, etc. And apologies, my dogs are getting very excited because the bin man's outside. Um, I wanted to ask you, 
um, specifically how many inpatient mental health staff are currently absent from work due to COVID and to what extent that absence is linked to either illness, to um, isolation or being abstracted to other roles? That's the first question. And then my second question would be around uh, these powers and whether they relate to a particular set of medical uh, professionals, for instance, doctors, or are they relevant to those in multiple disciplines? Thank you. So uh, I, I don't have today's figures in front of me. Um, I can certainly get them to a committee quickly if that might be the most best way of doing it. The outbreaks that have happened have been isolated to particular wards or particular areas, and they have been contained well in those areas, which is which indicates that our procedures are working. And um, when it comes to tracing and um, making sure that people don't mix that what they shouldn't mix. So the, the recent outbreak, the recent outbreaks in Hollowell, um, which have affected four different wards. They're different outbreaks, but they're affected four different wards, have affected 56 staff. And um, they're not all off at the moment. The, the, the outbreaks have, um, thankfully, come, come towards the end of that. Um, but it's affected 56 staff in total across those four wards, uh, across different professions. The recent outbreak in um, Lagan Valley Hospital, which is a mental health unit in Southeastern Trust, affected 20, um, 20 staff. That was just before Christmas, so that outbreak is declared closed. So it's not an active outbreak there at the moment. Um, if if you prefer, I can get you the latest figures and what the what the exact figures are. So I'm not quoting the wrong figures to you, and I'll, I'll get it to you as soon as I can. Um, that will be, be great. Yeah. Um, so, sir, can you remind me of the second question? Yeah, sure. It was just in relation to the powers, whether they relate to um, a set of. Professionals, so is it, is it you know doctors or is it relevant to uh, to multiple disciplines? The, the second opinion, powers is only relation to doctors. Is part four doctors? The coronavirus act provisions relate to different professions, um, and they do, do slightly different things. So, usually, when someone is detained for assessment or compulsory admitted for assessment, that's be reported by an approved social worker. The powers allows a relevant social worker that is not an approved social worker to carry that out. Um, the advice has been that should not be used by, another, by, by a relevant social worker, if at all possible. And we don't think that that will come to that, but th those powers are there. Um, the, it affects the holding powers that nurses and doctors have while you're waiting for an assessment to be made. So normally a holding power, a nurse can hold a patient for six hours until the full assessments are made on the ward. The holding powers are extended to 12 hours for nurses, and there are similar um, provisions for doctors. So this is a different range of measures that affects different professions um, slightly differently. There is a table attached to the letter from minister that sets out exactly what each, each, um, each do, but it affects different professions. That's great. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Pam and Thomas. And going then across to Orlea. Orlea Flynn, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Thomas. Um, maybe just to follow on, Pam, um, Pam's point around getting those figures um, around the, the numbers of, of staff um, that, that have been impacted by COVID and, and that aren't available. I'm wondering, Thomas, if could you also give us then a breakdown of the figures <clears throat> when you talk about an increase in demand um, as well as the staff shortages, if we could get um, the, those figures as well. I know um, Pam mentioned a 30% increase in the Belfast Trust, but it might be, I think it would be useful to get an overview of what that increased amount looks like across the north. Um, that would be the first thing, Thomas, if that's possible. And then I'm just wondering, so on the decision, and it's good that you are doing the weekly meetings and that this is all um, this is all based on, you know, that this is a last resort and that, that hopefully you don't have to use this provision, but it's there if you need it. I think it's worrying, um, even outside of a pandemic, the fact that we only have the four or five doctors that were reliant on those that small number of individuals um, to, to to carry out um, this work, I think I think that is that's worrying to hear, um, because I suppose at any one time you could end up with you know a number of those doctors that aren't aren't available. So that's something longer term. I think the department will need to look at. Um, but I'm just wondering, Thomas, can you explain the rationale? So. The decision to extend it from three months to six months. Um, why do you need to almost double that extension to six months? You know, just look at an option of extending it from three months to four months or to five months. Can you just maybe 
explain that a wee bit more for me? Thank you. The decision to extend to six months uh, follows what was decisions taken last year. And there was a risk discussions with um, legal, legal professionals in the trusts, so the, the DLS, um, trust professionals, the board, PHA, service users, and the Attorney General's office, the former Attorney General, and what would be an appropriate time limit to have a meaningful effect. And the agreement at that point was that six months seemed to be the appropriate limit because that, that gives um, that gives the backup of if something would go wrong, that, that we can make sure we don't end up without second opinions. As we all know that if someone needs to be self-isolating for 14 days, if those happens, or over 10 days, now if these things happen in bad sequence, it can affect um, an, a longer time period. So one month, while that should be sufficient in most cases, we don't want to come to risk that we, we just don't have second opinion doctors. So six months should carry us through a period and get people back to make sure we can deal with backlog and deal with um, others, uh, they deal with pa all patients within that period. So we don't accidentally end up with someone that doesn't have a second opinion. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Okay, thank you, Arlia. And uh, Thomas, just uh, given given the previous reliance on these measures and previous discussions that we have had about the potential need of of needing to see them reinstated, why did the department not follow normal procedure in this in this occasion and come forward with an SL one prior to prior to the SR? Um, it, it was a reaction to pressures that we did not expect would come in mental health services. We. Um, in the first surge, as, as we know, as we discussed before, mental health services were fairly unaffected to a large extent by COVID, um, both, both among staff and patients. We did not have any outbreaks in the first surge in inpatient units. O over Christmas, we had a number of uh, outbreaks and impact on staff to an expected was unexpected among, um, among mental health staff. So, when we assessed this in the beginning of January, we came to the conclusion that this was this was a very very urgent need, and um, we, we risked not being able to complete the statutory provisions in a very quick time period, um, and that's why these procedures were used. Okay, and and that in itself is is an issue of concern, and I was struck by the high numbers in Hollywell and uh, indeed in the South Southeastern Trust. What's your assessment in relation to um, why those why those settings are being impacted so much more widely this time? Um, I mean, that's, I know there's research ongoing on that. I know that one of our colleagues of Thais and Trust are looking at the structures of the wards. So uh, as, as you are very aware, um, we have some newer mental health units that are single bedroom, where, and some of the other units are not. So both Hollowell and Thais and Trust have uh, open bed, open bay uh, mental health units with ment mental health patients Things like isolation is difficult. Um, there might not be compliance with isolation rules and with social distancing rules. It's also difficult to take some uh, protective measures. So, for example, face masks among patients are often not a safe measure because the because the ligature risks. Um, which means that it's very it can be hard to contain COVID positive patients and to maintain those distances in delivering the safe care. So it's it's a unfortunate effect of the mental health infrastructure we have and the, the type but, of patient. But, but, but were, those, were those not largely the same factors that were in place previously? I'm wondering what has changed. Yeah, and like that, nothing, I think that nothing fundamental has changed in, in the period since, since the first surge to the pre-Christmas period. No, and that's, that's what we're not quite sure of. We, we, we simply don't know at this point what changed. Um, it was managed very well in the first surge. S something is been different this surge um, and we, we are not fully sure what that is and um, there is work I'm going to try to understand that um, I mean there, there might be it's a very unsatisfactory answer it might be pure chance that we've been unlucky this time we were not unlucky the first time but we were, we're trying to figure out the reasons see what have changed if anything and see what we can do better going forward is there is there focus testing going on that that the, uh, the, for the new strain in in conjunction with your investigation into that? Is that potentially a factor? I, I know that some trust have mentioned new strain. I am not an expert in how the testing happens and the and the different strains, and um, so I, I wouldn't want to comment if that's part of 
that work. I know that some trusts have noted that 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 that, that they have that fear that there is new strain. Um, what well, one factor that we think has an impact is that we're testing more stuff. So we have a number of um, asymptomatic stuff that are being coming up as COVID positive that we probably weren't wouldn't have been tested in the first search, and therefore that has a bigger imp bigger impact. Um, but I mean, the, the, it's quite early days to say exactly what these things are. We we, we are trying to figure out what it is, but there's clearly the clear difference from the first search to this search. Okay, and and can you commit to coming back to the committee as soon as possible? Because obviously that's an area of, of some concern, given given the vulnerabilities and given some of the uh, some of the additional challenges that are within that sector. I think that will be a particular concern. Could you uh, could you commit to coming back to us as soon as possible with an update on on your findings in relation to that, Thomas? Of, of course. I mean, we we obviously do everything we can to make sure that these services are safe. So the more yeah. we know, the easier it is for us to do that. Um, and when and if we know anything, I have no problem sharing that with your, with committee. Okay. And finally, for me then, Thomas, the minister's letter does refer to um, a range of a wider range of temporary measures to the mental health legislation. When is it anticipated that those will come before the committee, and what's the plan for consultation on those wider issues? The the, the revival of coronavirus act provisions um, happened on the eighteenth of January. They are not subject to assembly control. Um, so they will not come to formally before the committee. It, it has there was part of it has been notified to the assembly that they have been revived, but it's not a formal um, formal notification to the committee in that same way. Um, so I'm I'm not clear what you mean by that, Thomas. Are you saying that these won't come to committee at all? These these wider range of temporary amendments. They're, they're not. They're, that's that's my understanding. Yes, we we have informed the assembly that they have been um, revived. That the SR, which is the SR number eight, uh, seven, sorry, pardon me, this year. Um, so they, they were laid at same, or were made at the same time as SR eight. Okay. Um, is, that, is that being made via uh, LCM or some other, some other? Have those previously come to committee and revoked and now being brought forward? Just I'm not clear on that. They were, just, they were commenced in. April last year, and they were suspended in sept in August um, and revived this time. The suspension and revival orders are deemed as commencement orders, and therefore not subject to uh, assembly scrutiny. Okay. Um, okay. I'll, I'll come back to that. And finally, just I wanted to go back. I had asked you about you had you had referenced in this that it, that they they would remain in force until the end of the coronavirus pressure period. So what is the measurement or the, de the definition of the end of the coronavirus pressures period? The definition is when the staff absence rates and when the staff, um, just when the staff absence rates, when the risk of staff absence rates is reduced, or um, which, which will come with the increasing of vaccinations and staff absence rates going down. And uh, what level do you have? What level, what level triggers that decision of staff absence? It's a qualitative level. Um, where we don't see large scale outbreaks among staff in mental health units. Okay. Okay. Um, Thomas, thank you as ever for coming to the committee and for and for uh, answering questions from the committee. Uh, and good luck in the time ahead. We we can let you go now and we'll continue our discussion on this one. But thank you for 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 coming to the committee this morning. Thank, thank you. Very you. Good luck. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, could I just ask broadcasting if uh, all members can be brought into the spotlight there, just so that I can I can sort of see indications or um, see. Yeah, thank you. So members, um, I can advise that the examiner for statutory rules has advised that she is exploring a number of concerns with the department in relation to this SR. Um, would members there be therefore be content to note the rule pending further consideration at next week's? meeting once the examiner has reported would members be satisfied to defer it to next week's meeting that's fine chair yes, yeah chair. okay okay thank you members so members then uh, you will note there that there has been an additional item placed uh, placed there in the table papers an additional sr and the department have asked if we could take that one in advance of our item seven so we go to item eight and then come back to item seven just just a uh, 
a practical arrangement in terms of the department staff. Would members be content if we go to that ASR and then return to item seven as per the agenda? Yeah, sure. content. Thank you, members. Thank you. So um, just let me get that on my screen for a second. Sorry, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, Orlea, faintly, although I can hear you, but not very loudly, but I can hear you, Orlea, yes. Sorry, I'll hand turn the device up here. Um, just see, but before we, we leave the, the topic of mental health, I'm not sure whether um, I should be bringing it up at the stage in the meeting or under AOB, but I think just given that, um, I mean, already this morning, even with the issue of the looked after children with um, the ESR that we've just discussed, and the mental health um, impact um, of the, the, the pandemic. Um, there was comments that, um, there was a Facebook post that was shared recently by a member of the Education Authority, Nelson McCausland, and indeed a, form, a former minister um, around conversion therapy. Um, and I am just really concerned um, to see such a post being shared. I think that, I mean, given how serious this committee is treating the issue of mental health, and rightfully so, um, given that we know that our LGBT community is already, um, uh, you know, severely impacted by mental health issues, um, given, you know, um, conversations around conversion therapy and such comments like that, um, given that we know that that community is already a high risk vulnerable group to suicide and to poor mental health. Um, I think that it's, I think it's, it's really worrying that a member of that board um, shared such a post. And I think that given that we are the health committee, um, I think that it's important for us to- Orlea, well, I've lost you there. I'm not, I can't, I'm hearing nothing. Sorry, can you hear me now? I'm, I'm, I'm not muted. Are you hearing me? Sorry, Orlea, can can I ask you to pause there a minute? I, I have I have lost large chunks of that there and the, the final piece of that. Is everyone else hearing? Can I check with the clerk? Is every are you hearing, Orlea Clerk? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Orlea, I I lost part of that there towards the end of it. So if you can maybe just repeat the last bit you'd said about concerned about a member of that board. If you could repeat that for me, please. Yes, sure. Um, sorry, I don't know how much how much you, you, you caught there, but um, so I I do have concerns that um, that that post was shared by a member of the education board, the education authority board, and to think, um, given that we are the health committee and given that we know um, all the impacts on um, poor mental health on our LGBT community and that they are a high risk group of suicide. Um, I think that I would certainly, as a member of this committee, um, like to just put on record um, my, my disappointment and disgust at any comments around conversion therapy. Um, and I would like us to, if the committee is in agreement, I think that we should reach out to the Education Committee um, to see if they are aware of that issue and if they are going to follow it up. And maybe just to get the Health Department and the Health Minister um, to reaffirm and state his clear opposition um, to that position around conversion therapy. I think it's just disgraceful and the, the, the impact that it has, that it may have on the LGBT community, um, it's just not good enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Orlea. And I have to say, I, I thought that was hugely inappropriate as well. I have to say, I have an indication from Paula. Go ahead, Paula, and then I'm going to Chiara. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you earlier for raising it. I, I fully agree with everything you said. I um, couldn't get in for a topical this week to the Education Minister, just ran out of time, and I was wanting to ask him off the back of, of, of this incident this week where the Education Department is in terms of the research from 2017 sorry, into the experiences of the LGBT um, pupils in, in our schools. And I suppose I don't want to stray too much into the role of the Education Committee, but I do think that there's certainly that crossover in terms of mental health that Arlia has highlighted there. So we could maybe write to the Education Committee to ask them um, in what way they're holding the department to account around the findings and recommendations from that 2017 research. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll go then to Cara. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to come uh, in there off the back of both Paula and Orlea's comments, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think um, the comments around conversion therapy were unacceptable and abhorrent. Um, and I'd be happy to back, uh, if they're both proposals, I'm happy to second them. Uh, and I think it's unacceptable and we should be sending a very strong message to the LGBT youth that, that are severely impacted, as Orlea has said, uh, with mental health, that we fully support them. Thank you. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Charlie, for bringing it up. I think it was really, really concerning and obviously um, worrying. Uh, and the fact that you know somebody sits on a, a prominent ex-minister uh, and ex-MLA who, who sits on a board uh, that has responsibility for LGBT uh, pupils, um, services, the LGBT people, the mate, it makes it clear that this person has obviously a, a skewed, and a out-of-date uh, and, frankly, a, a warped, uh, view of, of LGBT people. So uh, I, I would be happy to, to back um, Orlea's proposals as well, Chair. But also, really, I don't think this person is fit at all um, to be uh, unbiased and to properly represent all of our young people. Uh, and I think really should uh, should tender his, uh, his resignation from that board. Uh, that's, from my point of view, the only sort of just resolution to this disgraceful case. But thanks for raising it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members. So sure. uh, from, sure. from that, yeah. Uh, yes, who's that, Jonathan, yeah. is it? Yes. Um, I, yes. Go ahead. I'm not aware of this case. Uh, I think Paula's position, which was probably clarity from the Education Committee in relation to a specific uh, report, uh, I, I have no problem with that because it is just seeking clarity. Uh, but in relation to the specific case uh, in which Arleth mentioned in relation to uh, forming a position on an individual to the committee. Uh, I don't support that if that's what that was, but uh, Paula's, I think, was much was, was a, a policy position as to where they were with that. I have no problem in, in that position, but again, I don't know the specific case, and therefore I couldn't uh, vote for the proposal that our, I think Arleth put for. Okay, any other views, members? Okay. Um, well, so there, there, there appears to me to be to be a number of items. A number of items have been proposed. The first is the first is that to record the committee's concern at the at the sharing of those comments. Now we can take these back to next week's meeting. I think we can. We if 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 members haven't seen the comments, I think it's a. Uh, it's it's better if they if they are fully aware. So some of the proposals we may need to defer, but we can look at them one by one and see if members are content are content now. So the first one was to record the committee's concerns. Um, uh, uh, the second was to write to the education committee to draw their attention to the remarks. Am I correct in that earlier? Yeah. The third, Paula, what was your proposal, Paula? You had a slightly different or maybe an addition to that? Well, certainly it's an addition to that, Chair. It was um, in 2017, the Department of Education um, commissioned and published research into the experiences of the LGBT pupils in schools about you know, discrimination or marginalisation. Um, my understanding is it hasn't actually travelled far in terms of um, looking at the findings and recommendations, but I could be wrong. So it was about asking the Education Committee about what engagement they've had with the, er, the department in terms of acting upon the research. Okay. Uh, are, members, are members content with that element of, of writing to the Education Committee on that research piece? Yeah, members appear to be content. Um, the, the, there was another element to it where the committee would indicate to the uh, LBG and T community our support and uh, for them, it, members content with that. And then um, in relation to writing to the education committee to draw attention to the, to the, to the tweet, are members content with that? Yes. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, is there anything further on that, members? I think I think we're Clark. Are you are you content that those are those are clarified well enough for your purposes? Um, I just wasn't clear if we got an uh, agreement on recording the committee's concern, chair. Is that when you were going to defer? Um, 
well, do, are, are members are members content to allow members to have a, an opportunity to look at this to defer the recording of concern and to proceed with the other two items, but to 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 uh, pick up again next week in terms of recording the committee's concern in relation to this matter. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay, members. Chair, sure, it's Alan. If I could come in. Yes, Alan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I haven't had the benefit of uh, of seeing. Uh, I'm not sure if it was an article or a tweet. I haven't had the benefit of seeing it. Um, I think that the actions that we have agreed uh, up up to this point, I think, are 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 fair, fair enough. Um, I think ultimately. Uh, it will not be this committee that will, will uh, you know, be taking any action in terms of uh, the, the uh, person's educational background. I think it will be uh, a matter for the education committee, and I think we have flagged it up to them. Uh, but in terms of, of uh, me personally taking a position um, uh, on, on expressing concern about it, I, I, I wouldn't want to do that until I was fully aware um, and that, that that's not uh, I'm not trying to compromise my position or anything. I'll, I'll certainly approach it with an open mind, but I would like to be fully aware of, of, of what really what the remarks were and uh, before I would uh, agree to the to the that last part. So I, I'd be happy for it to be put back a week, chair. Sure, that that would be my position. I'd be happy with that. Um, well, and, and just to state, I do think, yeah, I, I'll, yeah I'll, I've, I've got Pat indicating, and then I'll come to someone else. Um, I do think it's better if members have a chance, and and, and this unfortunately arose last week, and there were there were decisions. So I think just in terms of good practice, it is better to ensure that members have an opportunity to to uh, have a look at that. I'm going to Pat there. Pat Sheehan. Yes, Chair. Thank you, uh, and. Uh, I mean, if, if if it needs to be deferred, then so be it. <clears throat> but the 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 issue is quite clear. Uh, an individual uh, posted an account of his uh, conversion therapy experiences. Uh, I mean, this this conversion therapy has been totally discredited. Uh, in in my view, it's it's homophobic. It's uh, mumbo jumbo, and um for a member of the education authority to come out and actually um, uh, uh, congratulate this uh, this article and this piece of writing, I think is uh, is beyond the pale. Uh, it, uh, it deserves to be criticized at every single level. Uh, and I can just imagine, you know, uh, the LGB, T uh, community response to this. Uh, I mean, m many of us are of the view that this uh, conversion therapy, as it's called, uh, should be criminalized, uh, that it shouldn't be allowed at all. Um, so, I mean, the, the situation's clear cut. Uh, a, 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 a former minister of the executive who's now a member of the Education Authority Board, is promoting this type of activity. It's absolutely wrong and it shouldn't be happening. And it has the potential to damage the mental health of members of, of, the, of the LGBT community. And while it may be for the Education Committee or others to decide on whether this particular individual is suitable for a role on that board. Certainly in terms of the, the health issue and particularly mental health, this committee uh, should uh, state its position on this issue. Sianna Yeah. Logan, Cairn Yep. Pam, go ahead, Pam. Yes, thank you. I just want to concur with um, Alan's comments there and, and Johnny's before that. I haven't seen uh, the tweet or the or the commentary or whatever it is. I haven't seen that, so I wouldn't be uh, content in agreeing anything I haven't seen, certainly this week. Uh, that's all I want to say on that for now. Thanks. Okay. And um, in relation to Pat's suggestion then that this committee um, this committee sets out its view in relation to conversion therapy more generally, are members content that we indicate to the LGBT community that that this committee rejects the use of conversion therapy and and deplores deplores uh, 
deplores its use and, and believes that it has no place. Are the committee content with that? And then we can come back to we can come back to the tweet in question next week. Jonathan, finally on this, Jonathan. Not hearing you, Jonathan. Sorry, Chair, I, I don't know enough about the subject matter to form an opinion on it, uh, but the committees, I'm, I'm sure maybe others do, but I, I but I don't, so I wouldn't be forming a, an opinion on that at this stage from, from my perspective. Thanks. Okay. Chair, Chair yes. just on that, it, it, I mean, certainly, I mean, I, I too, I, have, I don't have any knowledge of conversion therapy, you know, just hearsay, quite frankly, and I'm just kind of concerned that, you know, if we haven't had any... Um, you know, research done or presentation on or whatever. I, I'm not sure that it should be um, a matter of taking some kind of committee decision on a subject we haven't even looked at. Um, I, that's not that I'm it's certainly not promoting it or anything like that. But I just I'm just wondering maybe uh, we should take some advice from from the clerk on 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 where we go with that particular element of this subject. I'll come to Jerry Carroll first before I, I I'll go to Jerry Carroll there. Jerry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Sure. Um, yeah, I want to want to speak in favour of, of the proposal that we absolutely reject conversion therapy and there's no medical basis to it. Um, it's dangerous. Um, I agree with Pat that it is homophobic, and essentially what it's designed to do is to try and convince people that uh, if they're LGBT that they're wrong and they've uh, chosen the wrong path essentially so that's very very dangerous very very worrying and i think for the health committee we should take a strong position that that's um damaging the people's health who are already facing massive health inequality so i want to speak in favor of us taking a strong resolute position um against conversion therapy thanks chair Thank you. And can I just clerk check with you? Is there is there any issue? This is this is an issue that that has uh, been in in widespread discussion over periods of time, and I think it's it's a it's a it's similar to many of the many of the isms that are out there. I think I think uh, is there any is there any difficulty with the committee taking a view on their their attitude to the use of conversion therapy? Clerk. Sorry, Chair, we're just trying to get Elise back into the, the call here. She's dropped off a wee bit there. Okay. okay. Um, Chair, I didn't catch some of that previous discussion because I was off, I got locked out of the call, but uh, I heard your last question, which was, is there any impediment to the committee expressing its view on a particular therapy? And um, first, I would say there's no procedural impediment to taking a view. Second, as you said earlier, it would be in order for members to be given some time to look to consider a matter before it's subject of uh, the committee's opinion, um, of which members have had no prior notice or any paperwork or information. Okay, okay. Well, in in light of that, I, I think I think to be to be sure, uh, I think we can. Uh, return to this next week. I don't think that's an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. We have agreed a couple of actions there which can go ahead and we'll come back to that proposal and to, to setting out a, a, a position from the committee in relation to this tweet at next week's meeting. Okay, members? That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you um, yeah, okay. Um, okay, moving on then to uh, the SR that I had mentioned there. So, with your with your consent, I'm moving then to the additional agenda item, which is SR twenty twenty one forward slash three, the health protection coronavirus restrictions number two amendment regulations NA twenty twenty one. An additional SR has been added to the agenda. I refer members to tab twelve there in your table papers, including a clerk's memo at tab twelve point one. Officials are here today to brief the committee on the provisions of this SR. So I'd now like to welcome, and um, I'm just checking online, that we have Liz Redmond, who is Director of Population Health, and Mr. Richard Duffin, who is from the Health Protection Branch. Do we have both Liz and Richard in the spotlight, please, broadcasting? Yeah, we're both here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so can I go ahead then, Liz, and invite you or Richard to, to give us a briefing on this SR? Sure. Thank you for adding us to your agenda today at short notice. Um, we're considering today the first amendment of the coronavirus restrictions number two regulations 
for 2021. That's SR number three of 2021. So this is the most recent amendment to the coronavirus restrictions number two regulations. I'll set the context and briefly summarise the statutory rule. Then I'll be very happy to take any questions members may have. So you'll recall that last week we discussed how the modelling of the epidemic considered by the executive on the 17th of December anticipated that cases would increase following the relaxations to the restrictions on the 11th of December. If the reproductive rate of the virus, that's the R value, were to rise and be consistently above one, then additional restrictions would be required around Christmas to manage the pressure on our health system, uh, which would flow from an increase in the number of cases. The executive therefore agreed at its meeting of the 17th of December to a six week period of restrictions starting on the 26th of December, which we're still in now, to reduce the rate of transmission of the virus which causes COVID-19. This included those enhanced restrictions between 8pm and 6am between the 60, uh, 26th of December and the 2nd of January, with an accompanying power for PSNI to direct persons home where they were engaged in a prohibited activity or intending to be so engaged. At an executive meeting then on the 5th of January, Minister Swan gave an update on the state of the epidemic, which demonstrated that the case numbers had risen significantly over the Christmas period. The reproductive rate of the virus, the R value, had risen to the upper end of the modelling limits and was close to 1.8 based on recorded case numbers with a significant increase in positive tests. It was clear that there had been a substantial increase in virus transmission as a result of behaviours during the pre-Christmas relaxations and the Christmas social interactions and mixing. And this was in line with the modelling projections that we'd had before. The impact of the restrictions which had been put in place on the 26th of December was not yet being seen and it was expected that their impact would become apparent in the data during the following one to two weeks and we can certainly see their impact now. In the meantime, the situation regarding hospital pressures and pressures on critical care were expected to continue to intensify and worsen from that date of the 5th of January when the executive were considering this. So given the level of infection at that time, the consequent and mounting pressures on the hospital system, and in order to ensure our health and social care system could manage peak levels of disease, the executive agreed that additional restrictions should be introduced with effect from Thursday the 7th of January. The amendment regulations we're discussing today gave effect to the changes agreed by the executive at that time. So the amendment regulations, that's SR 2021 number three, included the following. The power for PSNI to direct persons home was reintroduced, as was previously in place from the 26th of December to the 2nd of January, as I mentioned earlier. General restrictions were placed on movement similar to those used during the first lockdown, adapted to take account of those activities not currently permitted. Indoor and outdoor gatherings were restricted to six persons from two households with some exemptions. This was a reduction from the previous 15 person limit at that time. Gatherings in private dwellings were restricted both indoors and outdoors to one household or one household and its linked household up to a maximum of 10 persons. Um, this uh, was an alignment of the restrictions on outdoor gatherings in private dwellings with the restrictions on indoor gatherings in private dwellings. And amendments were also made to permit exercise alone with your own household, with a member of your bubble or with one other person from a different household. So these regulations came into operation at midnight on the 7th of January and remain in place today. So I hope that provides you with a summary of the context in which these regulations were made and an outline of their content. I'm very happy to take questions. And as always, just that the, the members bear in mind that the scope of these regulations is far reaching across all departments. Um, and certainly if we can't provide an answer for you today, we'll take that away um, and come back to you subsequently. That's all I was gonna say. Right. Okay, thank, thank you, Liz. Um, first of all, specifically they're on the regulations 5 and 5A. Can you explain the difference between where the six from two rule applies to indoor gatherings and there, there's indications of other gatherings of 30 people indoors are permissible. Can you set out where those, where those apply each, each of those? 
Okay, I think the, the key thing to, to, to say is that there are exemptions to these restrictions on gatherings. So it's, um, and there's some general provisions in the regulations that go right back to the time of the number two regulations being made in July. Um, so the, the six from two um, uh, gathering numbers um, do have exemptions related to certain activities where um, a risk assessment would still need to be applied. So that might occur in a work setting or an educational setting, for example. Um, there are also some um, uh, uh, easements around weddings and funerals that still apply. So um, funerals and wedding or, or civil partnership ceremonies can still have up to 25 people, but anything over 15, in fact, is the uh, number at which a risk assessment is needed. So okay, just, just to be clear, you. the six from two is a general restriction with exemptions. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm going down to Paula Bradshaw. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, thank you um, very much. Um, my question is, is the broader issue, or sorry, a, a slightly separate issue, but it's in relation to the click and collect. Um, there's, there's been a bit of um, discussion this week that it might potentially uh, be being reviewed by the Department of Health. I'm just wondering if you could give us an update on that, because I know a lot of florists, for example, who are very concerned with Valentine's Day coming up. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. It is a, an active consideration at the moment. So Click and Collect had been permitted for non-essential retail back in uh, the two-week restriction period at the end of November and into early December. Um, it was decided this time that it would only be permitted for essential retail. Um, and I think the, the big concerns that had arisen back in November, December, were that there were significant congregations of people in shopping centres and there'd been um, uh, certain, I guess, non-compliance issues around people being let into non-essential retail shops. And because we didn't get a very big significant reduction in cases as a result of that two week restriction period, we felt that this could be a factor. Um, however, I think it's come it came up at this committee uh, last week as well. There is a concern about an inequity there. Um, and this is why, um, in fact, the Department for the Economy with our support is engaging on this again. Uh, we don't have any outcome of that at the moment, but uh, I'm aware of the concerns. So sorry, just to clarify, you, you, there isn't even a timeline then for when you think that the executive, for example, will get a paper on um, reversing the decision or uh, upholding it? I can't give you that at the moment, no. Okay, um, I have a, an indication then from Jerry Carroll. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. A general question. As well, I suppose it's more about looking forward, uh, because you know me and many are concerned that you know there's going to be possibly a repeat of lockdown surge, lockdown surge, and lessons that should have been learned uh, last year may not be learned. So, um, I suppose the question is, um, in terms of this and, and general regulations, what is the kind of um view that they will become uh, ineffective and they will become replaced? Is it solely in relation to um, the R number dropping below one, uh, or is it based on a, a, an, uh, an accumulation of things, including the R rate, uh, hospital emissions, um, you know, new cases? Uh, so, what is the kind of um, the department's thinking uh, and view of when they will um, sort of lift this and other regulations uh, in terms of people gathering? Um, uh, and uh, I'm being forced back into work. Uh, so, yeah, general question, but the priority would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's more your your latter approach. Um, no, no one single indicator has ever been taken on its own to make decisions. I think that's that's fair to say. There's always a consideration of the totality of things. So just, just to... Um, Give you an example, I suppose. At the moment, uh, this week, um, the uh, estimate of R for new cases is less than one. However, we have still got a very high level of occupancy in our hospital of COVID positive patients. Our hospitals, and in particular the critical care um, parts of our hospital, are very, very uh, fully. 
um, absorbed in caring for COVID patients, and that has an impact on other treatments. So we're very, very keen to make sure that we suppress and reduce the level of inpatients in, in our hospitals. So at the moment, the, uh, the figures I was given today were that this week, um, the hospital admissions is now uh, just below one, but we have got an increase in um, ICU patients. So you can see that it's that ripple from a, a, a spike in the number of cases through to people getting terribly ill and needing admission to hospital through to people then being needed to be admitted to the critical care unit. So all of those things need to be taken into account. I mean, one of our um, stated objectives always has been to um, maintain uh, capacity and protect our health service so that it can actually perform all the functions that it needs to perform for us, not just deal with COVID patients. So that is, is something that's being very much kept under review. And at the moment, um, the, the the judgment is that we are not in a, in a, in a state to relax the restrictions uh, because we would just get another surge on top of what's already considered to be a very high baseline in terms of the pressures on our system. Um, <clears throat> so there is obviously um, a, a, pr a process we're going through to look at that. And there's the weekly um, review of all of those key data. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, uh, we've lost you there, Liz. Ah. Sorry, we lost you just after, pardon me, we didn't hear anything there from that. Can you hear me now? Yes, hearing you now, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah no, go ahead. I you were on. Go on yeah. With that one. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's fine. So uh, I'll go then, I'll just check with, with Jerry. Jerry, that's, you, that's okay, you, you've got that, and then... Yeah, go on then to Jonathan Buckley. Jonathan, go ahead. I think the pardon was probably the end of the conversation, but uh, um, yeah. no, sure, um, I suppose probably going back to Paula's comments, um, I did raise this at the last health committee regarding click and collect and the unlevel playing field that there is between small independents and multinationals. I raised it in the chamber as well this week. Um, can, can we get any indication as to and i welcome the fact that both health and the economy are, are, are actually working together to see if there can be a sensible way forward but i suppose what i would like to know was there any evidence that click and collect was being carried out in a way that wasn't uh, safe and, and and keeping with the spirit of the regulations to ensure that uh, you know we, we didn't have the, the the shops open but yet we recognise that they could still uh, operate in some form of limited structure. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that that was a problem? Because I suppose the thing that independent retailers are finding it hard to get their head around is that the multinationals, uh, whenever you bring people into a singular building, actually run the risk of causing much more community transmission. So I'd be interested to hear if there is any thought process on that. And I recognise that the this conversation is still going on between health and the economy. And I would like to just reiterate again that time is ticking on this. Uh, and I, I, for one, would like to see movement sooner rather than later. Yeah, well, certainly it's in the executive sites because they see it as an issue as well. Um, so I just want to reassure you of that. Um, I, I guess it's very, very difficult um, to ever pin down exactly where transmission is occurring. But what we know is that where there's more people gathered, there's going to be more transmission. That, that's, that's clear. So I think the big concern about, uh, you know, all of retail being able to use Click and Collect before and the way in which it was used was it did result in a lot more footfall in shopping centres um, than would be ideal. And we didn't get the response to that two week shutdown that we wanted to get. So there was, um, although it is very difficult to say that, you know, a, a cluster or a, a significant number of transmission has been associated with a particular shopping centre. I understand from the questions I've asked about that is actually very difficult to ever pin that down, particularly as a lot of people go to shopping centres. So there's going to be an association with a lot of cases with going to a shopping centre. So it's very, very difficult to untangle that, unfortunately. But we do know that 
we need to reduce social interactions. And, and that is one way to do that, particularly the way it played out during those two weeks. We don't want to have a repeat of that. And that is why we are engaging with Department for the Economy to see if there are other proposals that they can come up with around this. In terms of whether people were behaving outside the requirements of the regulations, um, I haven't got any numbers for you on that or any specific data, but my understanding was that that was happening from talking to um, colleagues in other departments. Okay, I suppose my concern was not shopping centres actually, but actually high street retailers, uh, because I think what has happened now, in my opinion, is that those people that were using the click and collect service and probably in a very restrictive way because the very nature of it meant that it was restrictive, have now just went to the multinational and are, are, are doing that access shopping there, meaning that effectively what you've done is you've pushed people into a, a more confined environment as opposed to allowing for a managed click for, and collect and I'm open for suggestions and how that can be more managed. But in, in, in closing that, you've effectively funneled people in to a, a more restrictive environment, which I think runs the risk of being counterproductive in the long term. It's just some concerns that I've had on, on this issue. Well, well, thanks for expressing those. And that's certainly the sort of thing that we need to look at. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so... Liz, uh, thank you for that um, for that uh, engagement with us this morning in relation to that item, and we can uh, we can continue on with our consideration of it. But we can let yourself and uh, yourself and and Richard go ahead. So thank you for that. And if I could ask broadcasting to bring uh, members up into the spotlight just for this next section. So members, we now need to formally consider this SR. Can I remind you that this SR makes further adjustments to current restrictions as discussed and is subject to the confirmatory process? The examiner of statutory rules has made her report on this SR and has no issues to raise. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in relation to? No, thank you. So if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 3, the health protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Regulations, NA 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Thank you, members. Okay, members, so returning now then to item 7, which is um, SR 2020 forward slash 355, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel, Amendment Number 27, Regulations 2020. I refer members to papers at tab 7 of the pack there. Uh, I can invite members of the departmental official is here today to brief the members on the provisions of this SR, which was made and came into operation on the 23rd of December 2020. It is a subject to negative resolution and the end of the statutory period is the 9th of February. Today's meeting will be the last opportunity, therefore, for the committee to consider this SR. The, the examiner of statutory rules has reported that this SR was made in breach of the 21 day rule. Colm, it's very hard to hear. Colm, sorry, this is just me, but you're, you're, it's very I hard to hear. I can't hear him either. Yeah, sure. Same. No, I can't hear you at all. Sure. Right? Yeah, that's better. It's saying. They're unmuted. Can you hear me now, Clark? Yeah. Okay. Apologies, members. Um, so there is a departmental official here today. Uh, the, uh, this is this SR is SR twenty twenty four slash three five five health protection coronavirus international travel amendment number two twenty seven regulations twenty twenty. There a uh, the papers relevant to this are tab seven of your pack. There is a departmental official here today to brief members on this provision. It's a it's via negative resolution. Therefore, this will be the last opportunity for the committee to consider. 
The examiner of statutory rules has reported on the SR. It was laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but she is content with the department's reason for that breach. So I'd now like to welcome by video link, Mr. Brian Dooley, who is the head of health improvement policy branch within the department. So um, could broadcasting please bring Brian up into the spotlight? Uh, hi, Brian. Um, you're very welcome to our meeting this morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, Brian, go ahead, please, with your briefing for our meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, I've actually got International Travel Amendment Number 3, which is 2021 Number 6. So, I'm not quite sure what you said. Could you repeat, please, what was the SI that you just referenced? Was it 2021 Number 2, did you say? Um, what I have here on, on my brief is SR2024-355. Um, Clark, can you clarify there? Um, I... yeah. That's what International we're... travel? That's what, that's what we're expecting, Chair. We could uh, move on to another item and get this checked and come back if that would be helpful. Yes, um, so I think we could we could move on to correspondence and maybe someone could check with with Brian in relation to the uh, that we're on the on the correct uh, the same page in relation to that. Okay, Thank you. so um, I will move on then, members, to correspondence. Um, so I want to draw members' items there to sever uh, items within correspondence today. Item 8.8 .8 is the December monitoring report for the children's social care coronavirus regulations. Um, have members any, mem any, any comments they wish to make in relation to that? And if I could ask broadcasting to bring all members into the spotlight for this section of our meeting, please. So item 8.8, .8, December monitoring round for children's social care coronavirus regulations. So just as most members have said, most relaxations are still being used, but the reliance on those would, would clearly appear to be decreasing, which I think we would all welcome that. Um, the, the fact that the monthly reporting is continuing, and I think that's particularly important in light of the vulnerability of those children, um, as discussed earlier, and we'll continue to monitor that. So uh, I certainly think it was it was something that the uh, the department had agreed to facilitate. So any other any other comments in relation to that item? No, thank you. Uh, so members content to note that report? Yeah, thank you. Item 8.16 then is correspondence from Amnesty International regarding the mother and baby homes and the Magdalene laundries. Have members any comments they wish to make in relation to that, given uh, the, the, the week that we have? Week that we have. Yes, Paula? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I yeah, thank you, Chair, and um, I appreciate it, Amnesty, sending that in. I know they've done an awful lot of work in relation to this. I see in our forward work programme, uh, we're due to have um, uh, Judith Gillespie, who's the independent chair of that um, reference group, come, coming before us. So I suppose um, I was pleased with the outcome from the options paper this week. I think it's a sensible route with the co-design programme, and I think that we could possibly hold off engaging with Amnesty formally until we've actually seen how that reference group works its way through its sort of deliberations around the terms of reference for the investigation. Yep, thank you. Um, Jerry, go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, I mean, very harrowing, but welcome report in, in some regards. And um, I think it's important that, that we, we discuss it. Um, and I, I heard the start of the meeting, Chair, I heard obviously with, with some uh, meetings coming up about this, but just if we can uh, make space that we'll have um, space for us to hear from victims and survivors as well, because I think some are, are, um, are concerned that it may not go far enough and some issues may have been um, left out of the report and a, a member, some members raised it in a debate um, this week. Um, so I think that's um, important as well. And, and, and can we get clarification, Chair, because um, the, the issue of the public inquiry was raised by the First Minister um, uh, on Tuesday, but um, it, it's quite vague um, as to whether that would go ahead or not. Uh, and if it, if it would, what's the sort of terms of reference? And it was kind of vague in the sense that uh, there will be a discussion with survivors, but um, uh, obviously discussion and 
and, and they being front and centre is key. But I, I'm, I'm at odds to find whether there will be uh, a, a public inquiry in terms of uh, what's the criteria for that. So if we can get a, clar- a bit of clarity on that, I think it would be helpful for me and, and I'm sure many, many as well. Thanks. Yeah. Um... Okay, and and just to note that we will be hearing from victims and survivors directly uh, through the the meeting that's being progressed as we speak in in relation to meeting with members of the reference group, so that that will will be taking place. Um, we are also having the minister in on our February eleventh meeting, um, so that will be an opportunity maybe to to get that that some clarity around those issues. Jerry, would that sound okay? Yeah, can you hear me? So, Jerry, or do you do, you, do are you are you proposing that we write and ask for a written update on on that, Jerry? Um. Yeah. I mean, if we yeah. can, if, if yeah. can write, if we can write, sure. If it's if it's um, you know, maybe we have something to write that's a bit easier because sometimes in the the, the the briefings with the minister, it's you, you kind of lose stuff and it's very quick. So, if we can get something to write, I think it would be be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sorry, Paula. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, the, the statement from the First Minister during the week, she spelled out that there was going to be a six-month period where um, the reference group would be um, expertly facilitated to decide what the terms of reference of any investigation, whether it's a public inquiry or not. And I think that it was clear that that was the direction that they were going in, some sort of investigation, and that that would allow them then the six months to decide what exactly they want investigated because I think Sir Anthony Hart's public inquiry as good as it was I think it didn't get into all the corners and that this six month period would allow the victims and survivors to express exactly what any investigation would look into so I think it I think it is clear but I do think that we need to be kept updated with that piece of work yeah and it's and it's, it's welcome that victims and survivors are central to that process I have to say that is that is hugely important Okay, then, um, so, uh, okay, so we're, we're content with that, members. Moving on then to item 8.22, which is from an individual regarding COVID self-isolation support grants. The committee wrote to the Department for Communities on that matter in November uh, to ask what grants are available and seeking an indication of measures in the department um, to signpost the availability of those grants to those who, who may need them or who may be able to avail of them. So any other comments on, in relation to that item of correspondence members? Would members be content that we write to the department and inquire about any assessment of the impact of financial hardship on compliance and self-isolation uh, or with compliance with self-isolation and the adequacy of financial support available? So we get a view from the department of what, what they see as the impact of, of the system or things that could be improved within the system members be content with that yeah okay sure. you, man. yeah go ahead pat sure uh, uh, i mean this is a in, in my view a, a very strategic issue um it's clear that there are difficulties in, in terms of some people being able to comply with the requirement to self-isolate if they have uh, contracted the virus themselves or have been in close contact with someone else. And it seems to be that it's those on on low uh, wages or on benefits and so on that are, are, are most severely affected, people on zero hour contracts and so on. Uh, and the difficulty in all of that is that if there isn't compliance with the isolation, if people can't afford to isolate, because, you know, if, if they can't go to work and get paid and they're not getting sufficient resources from, well, uh, you know, the, the Department of Communities or, or wherever, uh, it, it makes a mockery of any strategic uh, attempt to reduce the transmission rates in the community. Uh, and, and we're going to end up in this endless cycle uh, of just community transmission carrying on and on. Now, uh, we all know that, um, and, and, and most of us agree, that there needs to be a fine test, trace, isolate, uh, and, and support uh, integrated strategy developed to uh, combat the virus. 
And each of those uh, measures are, are links in a chain uh, and each needs to be as strong as the other. Uh, and, and we see in other jurisdictions, places like Norway, Finland and so on, where people get in some, in some cases up to a hundred percent of their wages if they have to isolate other jurisdictions, it's 80% and, and so on. Uh, and if we're, if we're going to give people an incentive to self-isolate, particularly people who may have tested positive, who don't have any symptoms uh, and, and, and feel that there's, there's not an issue about going out and about, I mean, we, we need to give people an incentive to stay at home, uh, even if they don't have symptoms, uh, so that they aren't spreading the virus about. It's it's the the resources that have been put to this thus far, and in, in my view, are woefully inadequate. And it's one of the the links of the chain that needs to be strengthened, along with, of course, as we know, contact tracing and testing and so on. So, I mean, I'm not sure I'm not sure where the responsibility for that rests. Uh, I I think in terms of the fact that it's a public health issue, that there should be a proposal come from the Department of Health to significantly upscale the support that's available for those who have to isolate. Jenny, okay, and um, Jerry, go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Just following off from Pat there, I think I think it's important. Uh, I was listening to Professor uh, Sridhar, who obviously was presenting to us last year, and she was referencing New York. Uh, where people get 100% of their wages covered uh, if they are forced to isolate. And previously, Chair, the, the last two committees, I raised concern that um, I feared that the reduction in isolation uh, was down to maybe taking shortcuts and that um, you know people forced fin- in the financial pressure and that being considered. Uh, so I think that's that that's important that that's um, drawn out, and I think um, obviously that the the minister, the health minister, has an important role to play. But uh, so does the whole executive, and the fact that you know several hundred millions of pounds um, likely to be handed back and unspent, uh, and people are faced in a financially difficult situation uh, and unable or, uh, to isolate properly is very very concerning. And just finally, uh, in the New York um, situation. There's also a, a people had a, a visitor, um, uh, presumably from the, the Department of Health uh, in New York, but a health visitor uh, to make sure people were getting food and their mental health was was okay, um, so they weren't just left alone for two weeks. So I think uh, exploring that uh, further as a committee down the line will be will be worthwhile. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, members. Yeah, I, I agree. I think self isolation is is becoming identified more and more as a key part of the, the response that, that where people struggle to do that, you then uh, create uh, issues within that defensive chain um, of finding and support and it's the support at the moment. So I think uh, members are content that we write to the department asking them for their assessment of the impact of support or lack of support and what, what further could be done in relation to that. Members are content with that. Thank you. Okay, then, and a member are also content to advise that individual of the action that Sorry, Chair, I'm Sorry. finding it very hard to hear your voice. Okay. okay. Okay, listen, I'm just going to I'm just going to try another headset here. Just a second.
And members, they uh, just advised the chair appears to have some internet issues down has dropped off. So if you're content to just take your ease for a moment while we give them a chance to rejoin. Perhaps if the uh, deputy chair would like to take the chair for a moment and propose a suspension, that might assist us. Yeah, no problem. Alicia, can I propose that we suspend temporarily until we get the chair back on line? Do you want to put a time on that, deputy chair? How long do we need to say? Try. 10, Ten minutes. minutes. 10 minutes, okay, members? That's us live now, Chair. Okay, thank you, members. So, uh, apologies for that disruption, and we are now back in public session, and we're resuming with a uh, correspondence at item eight point two five there, and this item is from an individual regarding the minister's reply to an, an assembly question on mesothelioma. Um, have members any comments they wish to make in re in relation to that item of correspondence? Yes, Chair. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, Chair, can I suggest that um, obviously quite a few of us are involved in the um, APG for lung health. So could I s suggest or propose writing to um, Joseph Carter, who's the um, head of the Evolved Nations for Asthma UK and British Lung Foundation, and he's also the, the secretariat of that particular APG, um, and that we would be asking um, him and their organisation or, or any other organisations that he feels appropriate to request views on that particular item and uh, to get clarity on the services provided in Northern Ireland and how they compare with services in, in the rest of GB and uh, the best practice more widely as well. So I think it would be useful if we could get some feedback to see if there, if there are um, widespread issues ar around the subject. And we can maybe bring that back to committee. <laughs> Chair, if that's oh. agreed. Okay, are members content with that approach? Yeah, um, members are good. Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Thank you. I, I got the correspondence from that lady as well. I think one of the other issues that she's particularly curious about is the levels of incidence in Northern Ireland. And I think that's maybe something for the Department of Health to report back on in terms of providing those figures. Um, I chair the all-party group on cancer and obviously this is a form of cancer so if there's anything that I can do to support that work through that APG as well I'd be happy to take it forward. Okay, sure. members, yeah, go ahead yeah, Pam. Perhaps then I could change the proposal to um, to actually ask that information all through both of those APGs if that's more useful to take on board Paula's points and if we, if we need to right to the Department of Health uh, around the levels of incidence, as Paul has mentioned. I think we should do that too. Yep, members members content as proposed there with, those, with that strategy. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you, members. Are you, Clerk, are you content that you have the, the, uh, the detail for that? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, members then, have members any comments or proposals on any other items of correspondence? Chair. Yes, Pam. Yeah, it's just on 8.19, which was the College of Paramedics. And I know we'll, we'll look at this in our strategic planning session um, later. But just to say that uh, Johnny and myself had, had uh, met with um, the College of Paramedics earlier this week. And it was um, very, very interesting. Or maybe it was last week. All runs into one. It was a very interesting um, brief from the College of Paramedics. And I think there, there's an awful lot more the paramedics can do in terms of, of transformation and um, in other work environments than, than you would necessarily uh, be thinking of, i.e. ambulances. There's many paramedics actually work in GP surgeries and in, in, in other settings. And I think there's um, it's, it's quite an exciting um, move for that profession. 
uh, I think a bit more awareness for, for us as a committee would be good around that. So it's just to say that um, I look forward to considering that in the strategic planning session that we're going into and just to recognise the good work the paramedics are doing at this time. Yep, yep. Thank you, and and I would I would agree with that uh, with with the remarks of the deputy chair. There, I have to say, when you do, when you get a growing understanding of the skills and experience and knowledge and training that all of these uh, allied health professionals bring, you can see where they really would be transformative. And it may be worthwhile in our strategic planning session to look at doing a kind of a. Uh, an event where we bring forward a number of them to highlight what it is they can bring to the picture to you know you've got uh, a speech and language which i met with this week occupational therapy all of these things bring i think very fresh perspectives into into the whole picture and i think it's it's fantastic that we've seen them being um given given their own position in relation to the management board and i think we could develop that by engaging across a wider range so i agree i agree with that okay our members other are members otherwise content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Content. Yeah, thank you, members. The table pack then contained two further items of correspondence. Mm. At tab 8.27, there's a reply from the minister in relation to the priority list for vaccinations. Do members have any comments or are you content to note pending our next session with the minister? Paula? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, during the week there, the Minister um, put out a, an updated prioritisation list for vaccinations, and we've seen the Health and Social Care Trust programme bringing forward the 65 to 69s. In many ways, this has thrown up as many questions as we probably have for Patricia Donnelly um, for this week. So I'm just going to propose that we maybe try to get her back as soon as possible because you know, all our inboxes are inundated from people who feel that they're, they've been overlooked or forgotten about, and I think that it would be very useful to have her back as soon as possible. Yeah, and we could take a look at that in strategic in our strategic planning session as well. Jonathan? Yeah, no, Chair, and I would endorse what Paula has said there. I think there's going to have to be some form of rolling brief on the vaccination for, for the committee. Uh, because it's changing at such a pace all the time. Uh, and I know there's no member here that's out to be critical of the programme because they are doing a great job in, in very difficult circumstances. But I think we do have to be aware to the, the change in, in even uh, supply and demand, etc. Like I, I suppose probably what caught me off guard maybe this week was whenever I heard that some of the vaccination centres were, were slowing down because the demand wasn't there within the trust. Now, I'm glad to say now that that's moved over uh, into su supplying the vaccine to that 65 uh, group. But I, I think um, from the committee's perspective, it is imperative that we are really kept up to speed with it uh, to ask those probing questions. Like I, One thing that I am particularly worried about, and I don't know if other committee members have had this as well, is that now as I say that they're moving on down through the programme, Patricia did mention to us about the rolling teams. I, I know a lot of people that are in that 80 plus category or that extremely vulnerable category that are bed bound and unable to go out to vaccination centres. And, and to my knowledge, I don't know if that part of the programme started or what the delay would be, but I think it would be imperative upon us uh, to, to keep a brief on that if the department can. And I know Patricia's busy, but I would certainly value it. I also asked at the last committee that the rolling data that Patricia gets, uh, we've we seen a sample of it whenever she came before the committee. I still think that would be extremely useful for us as committee members to be provided with uh, daily to, to keep us updated so that we can supply that information and feed out the narrative as to the program's progress. Thank you, Jonathan. Pam? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, I suppose um, I would agree with um, that Johnny's call there for like a, a rolling brief on the subject because obviously it is of vital importance to everybody, and more questions will um, come day on day. We know that, and there are many different areas and many different lobbies for for different people to receive different priority and all the rest of it. And I think there are very serious issues around the the whole. Um, school system and especially in, in very particular in terms of special educational needs and the fact that some um, staff working in those settings are, are to all intents and purposes actual carers uh, in terms of close proximity to to children with um, um, who are CEV and I think given that children cannot access a vaccine at this time there is no vaccine for them but I think, you know, I'm sure that the uh, JCVI will be looking to at, you know, 
at you know eligibility of other people on that vaccine list in terms of a protective bubble around those um, under 16s who are CEV in particular. Um, so I think there there are lots and lots of issues um, that will continue to come forward in terms of vaccination. And so to have Patricia or a, or a rolling brief on the subject, I think would be really really useful. Yep. Okay, and we can we can discuss that in, in further detail. And we have requested those data updates, by the way. So we're hoping that those will start to, to feed through to us. We have requested those. Very, very briefly, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Sorry, just a, a minute to mention it when, when Pam mentioned the, the SEND teachers. I, I noticed there was a decision made that uh, t- testing would now happen uh, within the this, this special educational settings uh, to ensure before for classroom. Now, I have had a number of parents on with me that are anxious to know, um, will their kids not be able to attend school if they haven't been tested? And I suppose probably that could be for a variety of reasons, given the complex needs of, of some of the children. Uh, could, could we perhaps as a committee just seek some clarity on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. And Alan, um, Alan had indicated there as well. I, I just come in briefly there. Jonathan had referenced her, the roving squads for people who are physically uh, housebound. Um, I, I raised that particular issue last week with Patricia during her presentation, uh, and she sort of dismissed the, the, the concept of, of, of roving squads. Uh, what she said was that district nurses and GP practices would pick up on that and that they would actually deliver the vaccination to those people who were physically housebound. And I asked, uh, you know, well, is there a contact number for people to flag up that they're in that category? And she said, no, the GPs, they would pick it up. They would know who was housebound and that they would would, uh, organize it. But maybe we need a little bit of clarity around that. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Alan. Paula, yeah. Um, Chair, just to go further, um, Patricia also advised that they were waiting for advice from JCPI in relation to um, taking punctured files or whatever the proper term was from house to house, and that she advised that they had received that last week and that they were giving that to the GPs and that would allow them for the um, programme of vaccination for the housebound to begin last week. So I, I thought clarity was received last week. Okay, thank you. Well, well, well. Uh, I think I think we can certainly um, we can certainly discuss this again in in our strategic plan. And there is clearly a, a, a need and an appetite for having a more frequent briefing in relation to the very very important vaccination program. And it is so dynamic, as as members have indicated. There are so many moving parts and changes within that. Okay, um, okay, members. Thank you for that. Um, moving on then to the. Uh, a tab 8.828, sorry, 8.28 is the 21st report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules. Are members content to note her report? Yep. Yeah. Okay, members, I'm now reverting then back to our briefing session with Mr. Brian Doolan in relation to the uh, the SR that we discussed. So if I could ask Broadcasting to bring Brian into the spotlight, please. And to reiterate that we are dealing with SR 2020 forward slash 355, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 27, Regulations NA 2020. Hello, Chair. Yep. So, Brian, it's SR 2020 355, as discussed, and I refer members there to papers at tab 7 of the pack. So, Brian is here today to brief the members of the provision of this SR which came into operation on the 23rd of December, on the same day it was made. It's a negative resolution, and the end of the statutory period is the 9th of February. The Examiner of Statutory Rules has reported that this SR was laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the Department's reason for that breach. So I'd now like to welcome Brian Dooley back to our meeting, and can you go ahead? Brian is the Head of Health Improvement Policy Branch in the Department. So Brian, could you go ahead and brief our committee, please? Thank you, Chair. Apologies. Um, okay, it's 2020 number 355. This is in relation to the South African variant that was identified um, in late December. And so England had made a, a travel ban on passengers coming from South Africa, and it was replicated by the four nations. Um, it was made in Northern Ireland on the 24th of December and came into effect um, early that morning. Um, 
there are no direct flights from South Africa to Northern Ireland, obviously, but there are people that are traveling through that would have been in South Africa in the preceding 14 days. And those people were required by this regulation to self-isolate with their entire household. Um, so that is really the ethos of the regulation requiring those people that have been in South Africa in the preceding 14 days to self-isolate with their entire household. Um, so this was one of the first variants that had emerged after the UK Kent variant. And it was indicated at that time by risk assessments that it was uh, possibly more transmissible. So that urgent action was taken. And that's why we uh, didn't meet the 21 day rule. Does anybody okay. have any questions? Okay, Brian. Um, so your, your, your sound for me there was a wee bit patchy. I'm just not sure what that, I was able to follow it all okay, but it was a little patchy. If you have access to a headset, that might work, work better. Um, sure. I suppose my first question, Brian, is in relation, are you aware of any cases of that? And was there monitoring of the isolation or additional support required given the, uh, given the isolation requirements? Were there, were, there, were there direct examples of that taking place? Um, I'm struggling to remember uh, from a month ago, but I know that PHA would have monitored that, and I don't know. I don't think there were any cases, but I'll have to confirm that. Um, but we were particularly concerned, obviously, with this because this was the highest risk variant that had been identified at that time. So I can get back to you on what monitoring was implemented, um, but I would be fairly confident that PHA would have um, had measures in place. Okay, and given the concern around these and a number of new variants, their increased transmissibility, their potential increased mortality, and their increased uh, and potentially um, less efficacy from some of the vaccines in relation to some of the variants, um, what cooperation has taken place north south? Given we're a single epidemiological unit, so in relation to dealing with variants and travel generally, can you update us yeah. on what, uh, what, what is currently ongoing in relation to improving that system? Yes, I can share. Um, I can say that from the start, um, we did receive cooperation from our southern colleagues in terms of if they had identified variants. And I can say that in the last week, there's been quite a significant uh, movement and we've engaged with colleagues and there's been an, an announcement from the uh, Minister for Transport, I believe, in, in Dublin, that they were going to share data with us and that they were going to start collecting the address on the um, passenger locator form, which they hadn't been up until that point. So when we engaged with um, officials yesterday and they confirmed to us that they were able to do that. We don't yet have a timeline when they can share the data, but they definitely will be doing it. So that's a significant improvement from um, the previous situation. And we're we're in very, we've also uh, instituted a interim solution where, which hopefully will be implemented from next week, where they'll be able to text people who are coming into Dublin and transiting to Northern Ireland, and they will be messaging those people with the contact details so that they can um, complete the passenger locator form for Northern Ireland stroke UK, and so that we can begin to quantify the numbers and where they're coming from, et cetera. So that interim solution uh, was relatively speedily initiated last week. We're hoping to complete the details of how it will operate in this next week and have it in operation by the end of next week. So that's quite a big improvement from the situation that existed previously. Okay, and, and I think that that's very welcome. It's welcome that that information is being shared. Are you, are you saying there, Brian, that the, uh, there will be passenger health locator forms uh, coming from so and and bear in mind this as you referred to there the Kent variant. So will there be the, the south have now agreed to share the forms south to north. Will there be forms available for the north to share from people who have travelled from uh, England or Kent or, or those? Is that the second part of that that you're indicating there? That that will be in place. Yes, that, that's possible. We haven't actually got to that part of it yet, but there will be reciprocal information. Okay, and the minister had indicated pre-Christmas that he was working on those passenger locator forms. So have you a time frame for when those will be in place and, and operational? I'm afraid we don't. We're dependent on a minute, really, on... Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, 
we're dependent really at the pace that um, we can move with our colleagues down south. They've gone to their information commissioners to um, confirm what information they can share and who they can share it with. It's, it's really operational things, like for example, whether it's the information is shared directly with us as a department or whether it can, for example, be shared with the PHA, which would be preferable. So we're hoping to sort those operational um, details out shortly, but until we do that, we can't give you a timeline. Yeah, and I welcome that, Brian, but I'm further asking you, will there be a passenger health locator form available for us to share north-south for people travelling from England who may travel onward into the south? Um, I, I don't see why not, but I can't officially confirm that. Okay. I, I, I presume that we will be sharing the information, but they haven't actually asked for it, so um, presumably that will happen. Okay, I'm going to go then across to members. So I'm going to go to Pat Sheehan and then I have Deputy Chair Pam Cameron. So go ahead, Pat. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Brant, for that. I'm just interested in, in, the, in the process uh, for introducing this particular type of regulation. And I, I presume this has been introduced because there is a concern that the, there may be a significant risk posed by this South African variant, would that be right? Yes, with the regulation, we've got greater powers in terms of enforcement. Yeah, and, and who who would be responsible for advising uh, uh, about the introduction of new regulations in this regard? Um, in terms of advising, it's relatively, it's a different number of sources. Um, we obviously take advice from the CMO and the Chief Scientific Advisor, um, but we're also liaising with colleagues um, in the UK in, in particular, because they have regulations that are very similar to us. So one of the uh, sources, I suppose, of influence would be the CMO group who discuss these matters on an almost weekly basis. Um, so between policy colleagues and the Chief Medical officers amongst the four nations, they would determine um, the direction of travel. Yeah, and of course it's right that uh, we, we should be introducing measures to protect citizens here from any significant risk that arises. I'm just uh, wondering then why when the UK variant, uh, the Kent variant as it's called, uh, became dominant uh, across the water, that there was no effort made to protect citizens here from that particular variant. Have you any idea why that was the case? Well, I, I'm afraid I can't answer because I wasn't actually working on this at that time, I think. It emerged over a period of time, and so it's difficult to determine when exactly, exactly the point came where it was identified as a significant risk. So. I wouldn't say that we haven't been protecting people here from variants emerging wherever they might be. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that question at the minute. The, I, I, I suppose um, the, the, there has, data has have emerged this week to suggest that 68% of the cases of coronavirus here in the north may actually be the UK Kent variant. And I suppose the point I'm making is that it didn't, this new variant it didn't just waft in on an eastern breeze, as someone said. Would, would you agree with that? It was obviously brought in on, on aircraft or ferries or whatever. Yes, obviously it would travel via people. Yeah, and, and, and given that the British Prime Minister and the Chief Scientific and Medical Officers in, 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 in England have said that this variant, the UK variant, is much more transmissible and it may actually have a higher mortality rate. It certainly poses a significant risk to the population here, does it not? If, if that's accurate, yes. I'm not quite sure if that's been and actually confirmed in terms of the mortality rate. I'm not close enough to the scientific advice, but um, yeah. so I would have to take advice on that before I could answer it. But you're aware that Boris Johnson has said that? 
believe he did. Okay. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. And Pam, go on now to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and a, a welcome. I do welcome, Brian. Thank you for your time. It's something I welcome that there there is finally some movement in terms of the passenger locator forms. And it's been an incredibly long year, and this was raised, you know, way back at the start of the pandemic. It was this year around travel, so it's disappointing that it's taken this length of time. But I do welcome that we're getting there finally, and hopefully. Um, that will all come in the fullness of time. All that information sharing uh, from every direction, I think, is is really vital in a, in a pandemic. I want to ask you, uh, Brian, uh, if you have um, any figures available uh, in around how many travellers from South Africa have arrived in Northern Ireland from South Africa since the rules took effect. And uh, of that total, how many uh, came through GB and how many uh, came through the Irish Republic? I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to answer that. I'm not sure that I can, but it but it's something that we can look at. If you would look and, and provide that information if you have, that would be very welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other indications from members there, uh, Brian, so I'd like to thank you for coming today i'm briefing us on taking questions on that um and if you could please provide any additional information that you've committed to providing there that'd be great but for now we can let you go thank you brian and thank we you. will continue our consideration thank you okay members thank you for that so now members we need to formally consider sr 2020 forward slash 355 have members any further issues they they wish to raise in relation to this sr no, and therefore can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 355, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment number 27, Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, members agreed. Thank you, members. Yeah, who is indicating there? Yeah. Okay, members, moving on then. Um, so moving on then, members, before we go in uh, to our strategic planning session, um, do members have any other business today's meeting? No, thank you. Uh, our next, uh, Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Um, just just a, a quick point. Um, I, I think... Um, it was very concerning the the fact that there was ninety million pounds um uh, not spent, possibly handed back uh, by the department, um in relation to COVID spending, and I think um it's still unclear to me what that was intended for, um so uh, I would like to and it's obviously very welcome that there has been as you said at the start sure uh, payment uh, for uh, healthcare staff and um. Uh, most, if not all, of the of the medical final year students, uh, but but I want to suggest that, that we uh, write to the department just expressing our concern because every single penny should be used to um, you know fight this pandemic, to support our health service, to um, enhance it where possible. So I want to propose that we just write and express our concern that that money um, wasn't uh, wasn't spent. Yeah, I think, Jay, we have actually already written in relation to underspend. And uh, just to point out again, we'd will have the member, the, the minister here on the 11th of February. Uh, or the, yeah, the 11th of February. Um, also to point out the broadcasting here only takes us to one thirty. but I'll go very quickly to Paula. Thank you, Chair. Just to follow on from um, Jerry's comments there, the, our, our inboxes are also full of queries about the eligibility and criteria for um, both the £2,000 payment and the 500 And I think it would be really, really useful if the finer details of that could be released from the Health Minister. So if we could write to the Department um, to ask him to put that forward, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Members content with that proposal? Yeah. Sure. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah, no, just... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, Jonathan. I have first of all, I have an indication from Pat, and I need you both to keep it very, very brief. Pat, uh, would you allow Johnny to go first? I'll come in after him. 
Okay, ju just briefly, I, I agree with what Jerry has said, actually, in relation to that underspin. And I think uh, Pat's urgent question in relation to the private sector was very interesting. And I think probably those should be elements on the agenda for the minister's briefing uh, at the next time, because I think I think it raised some important points regarding underspin and the, the interest and use of private services at the moment, which is needed. Okay, um, so Clark, can you just check that that underspend letter we already have covers it, and if it requires anything additional, then then uh, we we'll action that. Pat, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Chair, this is my last uh, meeting with the health committee. I'm, I'm moving on to education from next week, so uh, I just want to say I've enjoyed my time here. It's been very interesting. Obviously, we've been in in the eye of the storm. We've had some disagreements along the way, and I hope no one takes that personal. I've certainly had no personal grudges with anyone. And, and I want to thank everybody for the experience I've had. And I want to thank uh, Eilish and the rest of the staff as well, yourself as chair and Pam as deputy chair. And I suppose the thing I, I miss most of all is being chastised every week by Pam and Alan. I really miss that. <laughs> so well, thank you, everybody. Well uh, I, I wish you well. I wish you well in the education committee. But the one thing that I'm going to miss in the absence of having a summer holiday, I'm going to hate the virtual, uh, missing the virtual tours you take us on every week in South Asia. And today, he even he even took us up into Norway today. <laughs> I'm, going, yeah. I'm, going to book a, I'm going to book a cruise for Robin around Southeast Asia. <laughs> Yeah, I I, ha uh, I have to say I prefer the, I prefer the warmer claims. I have to say, go ahead, Pam, again very briefly. Uh, Chair, just to wish Pat well and in winding up members of the education committee and giving us a break on on the health. Uh, <laughs> I, I okay, would say and, and I, I would Pat, like, but it, but, it, but I wouldn't be being yeah. genuine. <laughs> I, I would also say that I would like to th I would I would like to very much thank Pat for his commitment, his diligence, his research, and all of that. And I think he brought a, a, a very interesting perspective to the community, and to wish him very well on education. Um, and also that that members are free to continue to criticise each other outside of the committee, of course. So don't worry about that. Okay, <laughs> members. So date, time, and place. Date, time, and place of the next meeting will be um, on Thursday, fourth of February at nine thirty a.m. via video link. Thank you, members, and we will resume at um, resume at two o'clock for our strategic planning session. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. Uh -huh. the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern.